Yeah. That's good. All right, guys. <laughs> okay. What's going on, guys? We're here. We're live. Poker Life Podcast. My name is Joey Ramon, a.k.a. Chicago Joey. My guest today is a young lady who who some of you guys might know, some of you guys might know, but you're going to get to meet her today, Jen, Jennifer Shahad. What's up, Jen? How are you doing? Hey, I'm great. Thanks for having me on your show. Oh, we, we, like, your, we like your headset. Obviously, you're, you know, you're, not, not many of our guests wear a headset on here, but you make it, it looks more official when you have the headset on, so I'm kind of, I kind of want to put mine on, but at the same time, like, I'm trying to do this thing with my hair, so. Yeah, I don't wanna... you don't want to screw up your hair. I, I understand. <laughs> well, Jen, thanks for coming on. I, um, you know, I, I think most people, my first, uh, like, when I really found out and I started Googling you was when I had your friend and my kind of friend Jamie Kirst that are on my podcast a long time ago, and something you said on Twitter caught my attention when you said, do you remember what you said about me? I can't quite remember. I think I was, like, I was not happy with the interview because, you know, Jamie is one of my best friends in poker, like, and there was something in there where I know you were trying to joke, but it seemed to be like off putting to her. He, she was like a little um, thrown off by it because you were asking her about her sponsorship and um, she uh, was explaining like why it makes sense to sponsor her because, you know, she has an amazing personality. <laughs> Everybody likes her. She's uh, good at poker. And you just kept saying over and over, like, she, because you're a girl, because you're a girl, because you're a girl. <laughs> <laughs> and I, um, of course, you know, she's, she was like um, my best girlfriend in poker. So like my initial instinct was like, stop haranguing Jamie. <laughs> Let her talk about how awesome she is. Yeah, I was kind of, I was, pre I was pretty joking at the time, but you, you were like, I don't know about this host. You didn't even use my name. You're like, this host, I, this host guy is just, what is this fucking guy thinking? So that was my, uh, that was my first uh, kind of interaction with you ever, and. It was quite a quite an interesting interaction. I'm glad that you've decided that I don't hate women, and I think that I think women are cool. So. Well, yeah. I mean, I did notice, like, even though I was offended by that part of the show, like, I I continued to listen, and I felt like, yeah, you'd obviously done a lot of research into Jamie, which, um, I I kind of learned new things about her, even though she's one of my best friends in poker. Like, I still learned a lot of new things from her from the show. So I, yeah, I, I gave you another chance. No, oh, well. well. Jen, thanks. We're happy, we're happy you're here. You know, you've actually, you indirectly provided one of our new favorite sayings uh, that we use. Okay. Do you know what that is? No, no, I don't. No, tell me. Okay, so we had our friend, we had a mutual friend, uh, Fedor on, Fedor, Fedor Hold. Uh, yeah, Fedor, okay. Crown up guy, and he mentioned that while he was on a recent uh, tournament trip, he played chess with you. Yes, in Prague. We played in Prague, exactly. He said you guys were engaging in chess matches. Now, now I was like, chess match? Like, what do you mean by chess? You guys are playing chess. What do you mean by that? He's like, well, we were playing chess. So for not, from from this point on, or from that point on, I've been using playing chess as a way to describe me hanging out with a woman or me going oh, on a date with a woman. Oh, that's so funny. You know that there's actually some ancient history behind that because it was considered that women and men could play chess without any kind of funny business going on, so it was like an excuse for a woman and a man to hang out. So I was kind of onto something with playing chess. Yes, exactly. Totally. Oh, okay. Well, I've been tweeting that out. Whenever I've been doing something, I'm like, I put it on Twitter, playing chess. I'm in an intense chess match right now, so. Yeah, no, we played in Prague, and um, I was really impressed by how good he was. Um, he told me later, actually, that um, he his first ever tournament cash was in a chess tournament actually when he was like 11 years old, and yeah. he won 500 euros in like a blitz tournament and I could believe it because he hadn't played for a while so he wasn't as aggressive as he could have been but you could see like he really knew like where to put his pieces. He he, he was a pretty good player, yeah. Yeah, I feel like Fedor's. Uh, I feel like whatever he whatever he tried to do he'd be good at because he's. Uh, he's a really smart kid. I mean, I still can't believe he's 20. I've, I've had him on twice now, and every time we talk, I still, you know, it feels like I'm talking to someone that's well beyond his years when it comes to maturity and thought process and mindset. Yeah, yeah. No, it was fun. I actually got to sacrifice my queen against him, so I was, like, really excited. It's not so, something you get to do that often in chess because it's the most powerful piece, so it's pretty rare to be able to sacrifice your queen and win. You, you, did you, you, you saying you won the match? I did win the match, yes. Well, okay. Okay, well, okay, let's say, let's tell mm -hmm. Jenna. So there's going to be some people out there. We're live streaming this right now, guys. If you have comments, questions, anything you want to say in the chat, 
go ahead and leave it. I already see some regulars into in the chat right now. We'll get there. We'll get to some uh, comments in a little bit. But Jen, okay, so if we're gonna describe you, this is my description of you, and then you fill in some blanks or, or you you fix it for me. So okay. I I think that you're a without doing using Wikipedia, which has your age listed on Wikipedia. If you have your age and your birthday listed when you when you Google you, you know you're officially something because when you Google me, my age and my date and my date of birth and my hometown doesn't come up, unfortunately. Okay, so I know you as a, a, a women's tournament player. You play some online, but mostly live right now just from being American. Yeah, and unfortunately. You're a two times two time women's world chess champion, which sounds incredibly challenging to be. And you're also a writer, and and that's kind of what I know. So so how would I correct that? Is that a basic, uh, a way, easy way to describe you? Yeah, you got a lot of good stuff in there. I'm sure there's more things that we can discuss. But yeah, that, that's a, those are the big ones. Those are the big ones. How long have you been playing? Um, wh when did you start playing poker? When did you get into poker? What, what well, year? my father used to play poker professionally. Um, he was one of the first guys to get into the, the sit and goes really seriously. So he taught me at the time I was um, finishing my first book, Chess Bitch, and I was too busy to learn poker. But then after I finished that, uh, I, I took it up and kind of took it seriously for a couple years um, and then came back to it right before Black Friday. So somewhat unfortunate timing, but in a way it's also worked out really well. Yeah. So have you played that much online? Has most of your learning and your getting better at poker been from a, a live standpoint? Um, I wouldn't say that, no. I, I love I love playing online. I prefer to live. Well, I like live for the social aspects, but in terms of a game, I way prefer online. So I was probably playing here and there for like five or six years online, and then maybe a year before Black Friday, I started taking it more seriously and playing more online. Hmm. And then... Um, I reopened my account under Israel, where my boyfriend is from, and I, I still play online whenever I get a chance. So. Cool. So you just play uh, tournaments? Do you play sit and goes at all? Do you play any cash game, or are you strictly multi-table tournaments? Um, I started out playing sit and goes, but now nowadays I pretty much play tournaments when I play when I get to play online. Um, sometimes I, before I, I signed as a Poker Stars Mind Sports ambassador about a year ago, before that I was dabbling in Bolada a lot because um, it was my chance to actually play online while living in the States. Mm -hmm. And um, I did a lot of heads up sitting goes there, which I started to get really into. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. But I really miss playing online more regularly. If I wasn't so busy with other things outside poker in in the United States, my family's here, my friends are all here, I would probably play a lot more online. I always resolve to take more trips to just play online, and somehow it never really works out. You know, like other things come up, but I guess uh, resolutions for 2015. And I think especially if you have a lot of friends or if you have a, a network of people that you don't get to see often, so you're, and you finally travel to go somewhere, you don't want to be sitting and playing online. You want to go hang out with your friends or you want to go see the sites a bit rather than sit in the room and grind tournaments for XXX number of hours a day, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. I really look forward to it. I mean, it's definitely one of the things I look forward to most. Like when I, um, I was just at the PCA and um, the Internet was actually really good this year. Um, and I, I thought I heard that it was going to be much better this year, so I was like kind of ex like the thing I was most excited about was just like having that beautiful view and actually getting to play on stars on Sunday. Like I arrived on Saturday evening, and I was just um, that was definitely the number one thing I was looking forward to. <laughs> how, how did you? Uh, how did that online trip go uh, down there? It went pretty well. I mean, not not like amazing, but o overall the PCA went well, and the online I guess uh, I think I went a little. Um, I bricked like the first Sunday, and then I almost bricked the second Sunday, and ended up coming like ten in the supersonic. So I, I I won like a little bit, but it was just like the obviously the buy-ins I was playing in for the live were a lot higher. So um, yeah, I had a good memory of the trip overall. That's pretty fun. Uh, I, I, just, I I mean, I, of course, it's just great to get in all those actual hand histories and have things to look at and study, rather than just like trying to remember all the details of a live hand history. So yeah. You, uh, you, I feel like you've said like 15 things the past five minutes I could follow up on, so I have to, I have to pace myself with uh, and try to remember now. Because you mentioned the first thing you mentioned was something that you you have to sit back farther so we can actually see this, 
or you have to adjust the camera, is your Poker Stars patch. So I actually didn't know you were sponsored by Poker Stars. Tell me more about wh what you guys are doing with that. Because as you said, it's incredibly rare these days for an American to have any sort of association or deal uh, with Poker Stars. Well, about a year and a half ago, I became their Mind Sports ambassador, and that is um, basically because Poker Stars started to get more involved with chess. So they run these um, big chess tournaments. Um, they've been sponsoring the U.S. Chess League, which my brother founded for a decade. But in the last year or two, they've also been hosting a big chess tournament in the Isle of Man, Poker Stars headquarters. So they had one um, last year, and they're going to have another one this year. So they're using me to kind of like, you know, talk to them about which players they should get there, kind of get more exposure for it in the chess and the poker worlds. Mm -hmm. So that, that's kind of how I came on board with them in a more, like, serious capacity. And then with that, I also um, promote them at, like, live tournaments and online. So it's, like, it's kind of, like, half consulting and helping them, like, forge this, like, chess poker connection. And then half of it is just um, representing them at different tournaments. So it works out pretty well. And I'm glad that they are sponsoring chess because, obviously, you know, with the recent controversy of them introducing casino games, I feel like it's really important for people to know that they're also interested in poker as a skill game and, you know, showing off uh, the connections between chess and poker. That's pretty cool because I know they're, they're, they kind of started doing something like that with the gaming community, too. They're trying to get... Uh, you know, people from that are popular in the gaming world into into poker, but I know they're doing that with chess. They, so they they sponsor. Uh, so your brother found found a a chess organization in America. Yes, it's called the U.S. Chess League, and it's kind of like a network of all the best chess players in America, and like they, they they play team matches. So he started that like nine years ago, back when he was a professional poker player on Stars. Like that's basically what he did. But he missed chess, so he wanted to like give back to chess as well. So that's um, and you know, because he was playing so much online, he had some contacts at Stars, and um, that's how it that's how it all started. Yeah. Damn, oh, cool. That's pretty. That's pretty cool. I mean, I didn't know I didn't know Poker Stars was that did something like that where they sponsored like a a chess. I mean, he started a chess organization. That's pretty sweet. That's uh, that's quite. A, I think that's that, feel, that seems like it'd be quite of a an accomplishment to just like put something together like that where you can organize something where the best players all like can, can communicate and, and challenge themselves and play against each other and stuff like that. Yeah, no, it is pretty impressive and I, I'm I'm proud of my brother and it's kind of amazing because he's like he's like your in in a lot of ways he's he's an entrepreneur in some sense, but in a lot of ways he's also your like typical poker player that he could never have a nine to five job. Mm -hmm. So he was only able to do all this entrepreneurial stuff because you know, he played poker and made his made his money exactly on his own terms without having to, like, answer to a boss or go into work, which basically just leaves you with a lot of extra energy, right? Yeah. You know, like, you're not grinding down from the commute or anything like that. Uh, he was always, like, kind of, like, um, not obsessed with making the maximum amount of money as possible either. He was really big on quality of life. So he would just play, like, four hours a day, and then he'd be done with it. Because he's like, I don't really need any more money than this, so that's that's all I'm going to play. Which is, of course, not an attitude that everybody has. And um, I do admire that because I always try to work as much as possible because I feel like uh, I spend a lot more money than I should. So I think that kind of life nittiness that allows you to work fewer hours is a really valuable skill to have in poker. That's, that's, uh, I've actually kind of, I used to be the other way, opposite of what that I used to like really be all about wanting to work as much to make as much money, but in the past maybe year or two, I've kind of gone that same route that uh, you mentioned your brother does. I've never actually thought about it quite in the same way or worded it the same way to myself, but that's kind of how I approach things. I'm not necessarily like, obsessed with, you know, putting in the maximum number of hours to make the maximum amount of money. And instead, I want to enjoy myself more and, you know, play basketball, play sports, and kind of do that. And But that's, uh, wow, that's, I never... Like the quality of life, that's actually kind of an interesting thing, and it's probably something that most people don't think about too much when they think about poker. They just want to like, they just focus on making as much money as possible, and how can they do that instead of just? Yeah, it's gotta be sustainable too. You don't want to burn out, you know. Yeah, it's very true. Uh, we're getting some good questions. I was thinking curtains. So. I'm sorry, you broke up a little bit, but yeah, his name, is, his online name was Curtains. That's right. Yeah, so I, I okay, so I never I really I really never played chess ever, but I used to watch this guy's videos on Deuces Crack. I just like found them 
so fascinating. I'm, like, is he is he like a uh, a good player in chess? I don't know much about his like chess credentials, but I used to love his chess videos he made on. on oh Deuce's yeah, crack. no, it's actually Lego Poker, not Deuces Cracked. But um, yeah, he a lot of poker players randomly watch his chess videos, which I think is really funny. He now has like a YouTube channel, and there's this game where he played a ten year old that has like a million YouTube views. He actually lost the game, but and he's a very good chess player. Um, he's an international master, but. He's, the kid he's playing is like the next Bobby Fischer, so. <laughs> yeah, I used to, uh, I'd, I'd like watching videos because he was good, but he'd win most of the matches, but sometimes he'd just lose too. So it's like, he wasn't just like, you know, poning people up. He was actually like, it was pretty competitive to watch. So it was, do you do you make any chess videos? Um, I do make some chess videos. Let me think, like, um, but I don't make them in that same way, like not that kind of like, live video. I do some, ch like I'm actually here in St. Louis, which is the capital of chess in America. There's like this uh, insane chess club here, which is like basically like chess utopia. Um, and I've done a couple videos this week, actually, where mm -hmm. I like give a lesson and it's all recorded. So you can find them on YouTube on the St. Louis Chess Club channel. Um, but yeah, I also make videos for one at one about oh open Chinese. You make open face Chinese videos for it once, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. That's kind of one of the things that kept me really into poker after Black Friday because, I don't know, it, you know, I'm really more of an online person when it comes to poker. Like, I love playing live and I've gotten more used to it, but it just doesn't feel like, especially since I'm not a life knit, it didn't really seem like a good strategy for, like, making money, you know? It's like, okay, I can go to live tournaments and have a good time and get a little bit better at poker and obviously, like, I can have an edge in these tournaments, but... Am I actually making money when you account for, like, the expenses and the partying and whatever and the random stores that I pass by that I have to buy something in? Um, of course, like, these things are, like, I'm not they're, not, they're not, they're just the way that I am. But then now when I discovered Open Face Chinese, that really opened up a new door where I was like, well, this is kind of like playing online poker because I can play at any time on my phone and I can get a massive amount of volume in. Mm -hmm. So, and I can go to these live tournaments and set up matches and, you know, settle accounts and stuff. So, it really kind of made me more hopeful about the future and kept me in the game. That's kind of, I think that's a big reason why people start playing other games, is that it, like, gets them excited or rejuvenates their, that's why some people I know start playing, their, they play PLO, is because it kind of, uh, it, you know, it rejuvenates that love they once had for poker that might not be there, and then they kind of start playing this game, and then all of a sudden mm -hmm. they, just, you know, they they start enjoying it overall, uh, all games. So it, you, you kind of, it sounds like that's sort of what happened to you. Yeah, I mean, I really like I really like um, you know, Linux still, and I I like playing poker. Um, and if I could play on Stars, I would I would probably like it just as much as Open Face, if not more. It's just that it, it gave me that kind of like. Um, ability to play poker even when I wasn't at a live stop, you know, which mm -hmm. I think is really important. Jen, have you ever heard of a game called Pot Limit Omaha? I actually don't play that. Which I probably should have gotten into that because yeah. I think one of the reasons I really love Open Face is because um, it's so math, so mathematical. There's so much math that you have to do and figure out, and I uh, that's there's that's why I, I got good at it really fast. So. Well, I was just thinking to myself, yes, yesterday I was sitting around, like, I feel like PLO is turning into, like, three-hour math sessions for me, where I'm just doing a bunch of math problems. So, PLO, it might be a game for, you know, as obviously it's my job as the PLO ambassador of the world to get everyone interested in PLO, so. But I yeah, know. I know. Is it too late, though? I mean, I was actually, it's funny, I randomly had a conversation in Prague with somebody about the same thing, where uh, we, start, we were talking about Run It Once and, and PLO and Open Face and all of that stuff, and I, I don't know. I feel like I'd have to at least be in a place where I could play a lot of volume on stars. So yeah. my my suggestion I give most people when they're trying to learn PLO is that if you can't like necessarily grind small stakes online somewhere, like this is like weird and, and I don't know if some people are gonna like would agree, but I think the play money games on poker stars, if you'd like three or four tabled or two tabled, is actually a really good resource for learning PLO because I did like a play money prop bet on there. And like People play, I mean, some people play, obviously, they play like it's play money, but most part, people mm -hmm. play are trying to get better, and they're trying to compete. So it's actually not the worst uh, resource to get better at PLO for people out there that are listening that have discipline and can treat yeah. that as, as such. 
I believe that because especially if there's a lot of math, then it shouldn't like really matter as much if you're playing against uh, you know perfect players or whatever. Like for instance, in open face, I played a lot of free rolls on Tony Bed, and I got I, I also before I wanted to play high stakes, I like to play against the AI on the phone just for free. You know, obviously that's just you're just playing against a computer, and the computer was playing horribly, but you still learn a lot from it because. You can just like you know screenshot the interesting spots and then do math on it, and um, it's just a lot better than losing <laughs> losing a ton of money um, by um, playing for for bigger stakes and, and trying to learn from that. So. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Like with PLO, it's about uh, I think it's about uh, getting in situations, figuring out you know what your what your equity is against a certain type of range. Yeah. The hardest thing is like you have a hand in a spot, or you three bet, or you cold call. And you get into a situation where it's just a matter of repetition. It's like learning what that person shows up with and how your hand does against what he shows up with. And it's like a, it really, it feels like a big math problem to me. All, all, most of the hands, most of the situations. I guess you could actually say that about all games of poker in general are kind of math problems. You, you could, I guess. But, I mean, it's like in open face, for instance, there's like very, very little exploitative strategies, you know? Oh, it's really? Like, so it's all, it's like pretty GTO based game. Yeah, yeah, it's just like there would be very limited instances where you would try to exploit your opponent. Kind of like in chess, similar to chess, like you could, uh, if I'm playing against a weak player in chess, I'm not going to change my strategy really almost ever. Just always going to just try to play the best moves against him and win. Because if they're that much weaker than you, that you could exploit them with a suboptimal strategy, then you're just going to beat them by playing regularly anyway. So you just might as well do that. Just in case you're wrong and they're better than you thought they were, you know. Mm-hmm. So. So I guess that's bad for weaker players. That that it's uh that's bad for weaker players, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. So really, like the psychology when it comes to something like chess would be more like before the game even starts. Like once the game starts, you're just trying to play the best move at all times, pretty much. Hmm. I don't want to. You sound like a scary person. I want to play in chess. <laughs> do, people, do, like, do guys challenge you in chess like, uh, pretty often? Well, it's hard to get high-stakes chess matches, I must tell you. It's very tough because there's no luck, you know? So, you know, my brother, Curtins, uh, once played a very famous game against Durr where they played for $50,000, but um, Greg was playing without one of his rooks. Hmm. That's the only way you're going to get, like, a really high-stakes chess game if you give up a massive edge like a rook. How did that turn out for him? Um, he won. Yeah. Must be nice. Have you ever gotten a situation like that where you 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 uh, gave a handicap and and played a match for decent stakes? No, I never got into like a big high stakes match like that in chess. I mean, so yeah, I'm I'm open to it though. So if anybody has any offers, uh, there was a <laughs> I like guy, it. Apparently there was a guy kind of like roaming the, the high stakes area at PCA this year looking for some chess action and like it was so disappointing because like one of the guys was like, yeah, I wrote down his name and number and then he starts fishing for it and he's like, I can't find it. Like, the, <laughs> like who's this mythical chess action guy? Like the one time someone's just going to walk around looking for high stakes chess action and then just happens to, the information happens to disappear, huh? Exactly, yeah. Kind of unfair, but what are you going to do? I'd be incredibly tilted. If I were you, I'd maybe I'd like I'd find someone to like infiltrate the, the like a chess community just to find you a match at some point in time. I don't know how profitable that'd be. How many matches they'd actually find you because they can like Google, they can just look you up and like learn about your your skill level, right? Like there's no mystery really when it comes to playing someone. It sounds like. Well, yeah, but if you play without a bishop or a rook, then who knows what's gonna happen, right? Mm -hmm. That's true, and then I guess you might find some. Do you? I, I actually don't. This is true, but you know, in poker obviously people overestimate their edge or how good they are. Does that happen with something in chess too? Where if you Not said I'll, I'll spot you this, and then someone might overestimate their edge in a situation. Yeah, that could happen. It could. Yeah, definitely. So, I'm. I'll be on the lookout. You sound like you're craving for something. You sound like you're kind of. You seem like you got a little. Uh, you got a little DJ tendency. You like that action. It sounds like the high. You, it seems you like. I don't know. It was, did you say that's true? I at first I would say no, but like you have to get like I when I started playing open face, I started playing for some pretty high stakes at some point, and um, you have to get used to it. I learned very quickly because otherwise it'll just destroy your life. Like if you get if you get too upset about losing a bunch or too excited about winning a bunch. Oh yeah. So, yeah, 
you know, once you're once you're over those first like few big upswings and downswings, I think you get more immune to it. For sure. I think that's one of the biggest disciplines and that's something that you really can't explain or you can't really uh, tell someone that's never really played high stakes and gone through the swings is like your ability to mentally deal with that adversary. Ad 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 adverse. Is that the right word I'm trying to use? That's good. That's fine. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I'm not a professional grammar expert over here. Okay. But dealing with those swings and the variance is like even when you're winning, like being able to deal with winning that type of money is extremely important for your long term success. And I think that's what a lot of people can't really handle is. It's it's tough. Obviously, I guess you know you you sound like you you've had some ex a lot of experiences with um, uh, big upswings and potentially big downswings in your. Although I have to say, I still like I'm still updating my spreadsheet way more often when I'm winning. Really? Oh, see. So you... Like it's an open face you can choose like at any time, you know. So. Oh, so like, I just noticed like you know you just like want to like write it down more like if you're playing continuously and like I do notice patterns also that like if I'm winning too much and I'm running too well, I feel like that's a moment where you're at risk of playing poorly. It's not just like, you know, or if you're losing too much, but it's like that, that massive downswing or that massive upswing, I feel like are two moments. And actually less for me, less than massive downswing. I feel like when I'm downswinging hard, I'm like pretty like, I'm, I'm pretty good about like, okay, now I really have to play well because otherwise I might just be terrible and I don't know it, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm definitely more at risk probably for playing a little worse when I'm like winning a lot. This is gonna if I if I expand on this point any further, it's gonna be very strategic for other people that play high stakes cash games online. So I'm not gonna expand on any further. But that's a great that that whole entire topic and this whole entire like idea is honestly one of the most important things that matters at high. I feel like at high stakes cash or I I'm not sure about tournaments necessarily because I know some people only have you know five percent of themselves in high stakes tournaments. You know but so. Do you uh do you do you do you know much about that? Are you pretty involved in the staking and the selling action, buying action, and that type of uh? Well, I mean, I'm aware of I'm aware of how much people sell themselves, of course. Yeah, so I know like I know how these things work and how like you know it it makes it easier for the person to not have to be so stressed when they have like sold a massive piece of themselves. Yeah. yeah. But I think one thing that's underestimated, I think that the uh the really high stakes guys are probably smart enough to know this, but I think like one thing that's underestimated, which is probably something I'm really aware of because I do so much work outside poker, is how much time it takes to sell and buy pieces. I, like, quantify the hours put into that. And to me, it's like, I mean, it, it, I stopped buying pieces of people not because I think it's a bad deal, but because I was, like, just, like, texting them and transferring the money and stuff is taking me, like, a half hour. So it's like that half hour is quantifiable, you know? And I think that if you have to, like, sell 80% of yourself in a tournament and you add up the hours of, like, transferring money and all that stuff, it's just, like, it's a lot of lost labor, basically, you know? Interesting. So you you kind of, it seems like you you really try to value all of the your time in a day much more than most people might try to do then. Well, I think that, I don't know, maybe I'm also, I'm also pretty neurotic, so, like, I think with stuff, especially with, like, selling action and buying action, like, if I'm trying to, like, I think that if I if I start texting somebody trying to, like, iron out the details of a deal, um, it kind of, like, absorbs my attention maybe more than other poker players who could just, like, text back and, like, not think about it. So, I don't know, it, it, it absorbs my attention more, so for me, it's just, like, uh, I find all that, all that to be relevant, yeah. Hmm. So that would that would lead you to trying to sell to uh, I guess a small number of investors if you did choose to sell action then. Absolutely. I th that's why I think like when people think when people like want to buy like really tiny pieces as a sweat and then people come on two plus two and like complain about it because they're like oh that's a bad deal. Like I think that um you know when you're buying like one or two percent of somebody in like the main event of the World Series of poker or something. Um, you should play at, pay a higher markup because you're taking a sweat. Or it's not that you should, but like it's justifiable for the um, the person who's selling to sell that because if you va if they value their time, then it kind of all makes sense. That makes sense. You know what I mean? So uh, interesting. Uh, do you do you find yourself that you don't play? I mean, do you play a lot of higher buy-in tournament? I actually don't know. So do you do you play main most of the higher buy-in stuff like the big main events or the, any of the high roller type of stuff like that? I don't play in like, well I played in the open face Chinese high roller. I don't play like no limit high roller events, but I do play like some of the main events, especially like 
the WSOP main event, and then, like, if I'm on, like, some major tour, I'll usually play the main event of that. And um, I'm not going to say that I really practice proper bankroll management, but because, like, I don't really tour the live scene all the time, I feel like it doesn't really matter as much, you know? It's like... I was going to say, you don't seem... Yeah. I was going to say, do you sell action? But I was like, you don't seem like the kind of person who necessarily, like, would, like, really want to sell out of action because, you, like I said, you seem like you got some gamble in you. And I do sell action, but like I don't like I don't feel like I need to sell like the ke- the correct amount via like ke- Kelly Criterion or something. Yeah. You know, like it's okay if I like if I gamble a little bit because um, I'm not like relying on playing MT- live MTTs to like make my income. You know. Yeah, you 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 like you like PLO. You like the high stakes PLO world, my friend. You tell you enjoy it. Maybe I, you might be too. I don't want like good players to come. Well, okay, I, I'm gonna have to go and uh, play those poker stars uh, play money games to start out. Here we go. This is how they get them addicted, guys. You you, you yeah. start like once you go but once you go uh, once you go black, you never go back. Once you go PLO, you never go. I don't know the. I haven't thought of a finishing for that statement, but let's uh let's 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 talk about some uh, chat chat. Let's see some comments. Chat 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 comments. What Jan say? Jan Olson. Jan says if she opens YouTube and mutes it, she can look at it like us. Greg did it when they made that podcast. Just so he could follow the questions. Yeah, do you have the YouTube uh, the video open with the questions in the chat? Um, open? Yeah, I think I do. Okay, it's just like weird seeing myself there. But yeah, oh, I see some people asking about like I see people asking about the fried liver opening. That's a good opening. You uh, yeah, you can pause the video so you don't look at yourself, and you can oh, pause, okay, cool, you got can pause it. it on me, and that way you don't see yourself because it is kind of weird when you like look at yourself, and especially yeah. it's yeah, it's kind of it definitely creeps me out sometimes too. But they is that a that's a I saw that comment. That's a chess related topic, correct? Yes, exactly. Ask Jen. Zach says, "What's up, Zach?" Ask Jen about the fried liver. Is that a real thing? I thought you were just making that. That is up. a really real thing. Like some of these openings have just super cool names, right? Like the fried liver attack or the dragon. So um yeah, the fried liver is um not the best opening, but it's pretty decent. It's one in which you could basically go to attack f7 really quickly. Which oh. is the weakest square when you start out playing black um, against the e4. I, I guess this is all going to sound like Greek to people who don't play chess, but I mean, we probably have a few chess listeners. So I think so. Epicurus, my boy, Epicurus, man, Mr. Positivity. He, he, I can tell he, uh, he wants to have a sit-down discussion with you about chess because he keeps asking questions in the chat that are, that are very related to chess. Epicurus, what's up, man? Daniela, what's up, man? He says, how strong does a chess player? have to be to make a living just by playing chess? Great question. Well, the interesting thing about the chess economy is that there's a ton of money that is um, injected into it through education and chess students. Like, people think that chess is something that will help young people, um, you know, get better grades, get into college. So there's really a lot of money in teaching chess, even more than, in, in a different way than in poker, right? Like, in poker, you're, learning, you're teaching people how to get better so that they can make money, right? Where they chess, it's more like personal training. Like you're, they're not going to make money because you teach them chess, but they'll pay you anyway, just because they want you to make them smarter. So that's where like, a lot of the money from chess comes. But to be um, a professional just by playing and not by teaching or writing, it's very very hard. Probably only like the top ten, top five in the country can do it. Sounds hard. Yeah, sounds challenging for it to. Yeah. But I guess it's kind of like when you're a uh, a, a losing Nolan player, a, a losing Nolan Holden player these days. The only way they make money is by coaching and teaching people. So it kind of sounds like with chess, you have to have some of those kind of tendencies where you, the only way you can make money is by teaching and and marketing yourself. And right. Although for chess, it's like it's way it's a it's even the very best players make some money from that. You know. I guess. So it doesn't have that kind of like negative connotation, I guess, that you're suggesting it might have in poker. Fucking those those break even no limit coaches, man. I'm telling you, they're everywhere these days. Now they're on Twitch. All the break even no limit coaches are joining Twitch now. They're gonna try to make money off donations on Twitch. So, do you? Uh, yeah, do you it is tough, man. I mean, I can imagine it's hard with um, if you don't know the right people in poker and you just look at these massive number of coaching options, like trying to figure out who will actually help you play better poker and win more money. Oh, that must be a really difficult thing to, to navigate. I mean, what would you suggest to people like for how they would even go about that? 
So this is what some people started doing, and so I guess indirectly, it's I think it's a good way, is that some people message me on 2 Plus 2, and they say, hey, I, I, I know you play PLO, but I'm interested in getting No Limit Coaching. Can I ask you who a couple of these people are, and can you recommend a couple of people to me? Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, if you, if you send a message like that to someone, most people are, might ignore it, but if you ask people who have some sort of reputation or some sort of clout in the community or ha- like have an, uh, who understand what's happening, ask them who they would recommend, I think is probably the best idea. And just because they're going to know, like, all right, dude, that guy, I wouldn't go with that guy, or that guy has a long reputation of, you know, doing good or having good results. Because when you see the coaching threads, it's, it's, you know, people, their friends are coming in there, they're recommending, like, oh, this guy's good, this guy, I got coaching from him, and all that type of stuff. So it's definitely challenging to find a coach if that's what you're looking for, a one-on-one coach. Yeah, I mean, especially because if you go with the wrong person, you can learn, like, some bad habits, you know? So it's pretty tricky. I think it's probably some pretty tricky uh, terrain. Probably it's better to start, like, with a, you know, not to give too shameless of a plug for them, but to start with a website, like, run it once, and then, like, watch some videos and see, like, who who you think might mesh with you, you know? Yeah, I think that'd be good. I guess what you find with those type of things is that those coaches on those sites, like, actually don't really do one-on-one coaching. Right, a lot of them don't. That's right. Yeah, but th- but then exactly what you were saying, you could like you could say like, hey, I really enjoy your videos. Like, I know you don't give coaching, but who do you recommend? A lot of people would totally respond to that if you sh- if you show the respect that you've actually watched their videos and you like them, and you're just looking for like a response. Yeah, for sure. that's actually a pretty good idea too. You could probably leave it even like even on the chat comment on like run at once. You could say, hey, like, do you do coaching or do you can you recommend someone similar to your style that you know that coaches. And then if that guy doesn't get back to you, then maybe one of the people that watches the video would mm-hmm. get back to you. That's actually a pretty good idea. But I never thought about that. Like if I'm just an outsider who's like navigating the world, looking to get better at poker, and like I go to the, I go to these like coaching listings, I'm like, oh, this guy's this guy won all this money. Like I mean, and they probably uh, it's yeah it's yeah I know once you've been in poker for a while and you know a lot of people in it, I think it's easy to forget like how confusing the whole subculture and, like, social aspect of it can be to somebody starting out, you know? For sure. I mean, how did you, like, what exactly did you, you had your brother, so, and obviously I think your brother seems like a pretty good resource when it comes to learning anything. How did you? Yeah, he was really helpful for teaching, but, you know, he wasn't very into, like, the live scene. Like I said, he would, like, play his few hours of poker, make his money, and then, like, live the rest of his life, which is awesome, but... He didn't like. He went to the World Series a couple of years, but you know he didn't really dig it that much. And then after Black Friday, he just quit completely. So, so how did you like navigate finding like how did you how did you make friends? You know how did you get this network of people? How did you get better? Like what what was your what was your approach to it? Yeah, it took a really long time, and I think actually like one of the positives at least of Black Friday was I met a lot more people. You know, obviously I I, I loved playing online, but um, I was I was I basically didn't know anyone in poker because I was just playing online all the time and um, not that much. Like I still had other work, but it it really changed a lot of things. You know, mm-hmm. it it makes it more fun, obviously, knowing a lot more people, people that you can root with. You know? uh, I agree. Did you, so was it something like you went to these live things and you just you kind of you know bonded with other women because you know there's that many women in poker and then you from there you kind of grew your network of friends from that point? Yeah, but it took a really long time. I mean, I would go to live events like here and there for years and I basically knew no one. You know, for like maybe the first three years that I played, but I didn't go to that many. But that's why I'm saying I feel like I can understand how it can be like not that much fun or it can be it can seem kind of clickish to some people. I think. Yeah, because for sure. it's really easy to like go to a poker tournament and for it to be like a blast and like know a bunch of people and have fun if you bust and if you go deep, like be really excited that you have people like rooting for you. But um, not everybody has that experience. So I think it's important to be in, um, attuned to that, you know? Yeah, it's true. I actually don't even, I, I haven't really gone to many live tournament stops, so I, I don't, I, I can only imagine how, my, how it might feel to, you know, people coming up in the game and trying to meet people and make friends. Mm-hmm. Uh, Herman said, Joe, what are those scratch marks on your wrist? I kind of look like a drug addict right now, but this is from basketball. So when you play six hours of basketball a day, sometimes you get a lot of pe- these people scratching you when you're going to the lane. So I have, like, scratch marks up and down all my arms. So that's... You, you play six <laughs> hours of basketball a day? Wow, that's a lot. Well, I play, like, five or six hours, like, three or four or five days a week. God, you must have to eat so much. 
Well, I should eat more, but I'm 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 trying to like get my weight up to like you know 205. I'm at like 185 right now, but it's really hard when you play so much basketball and you do so much cardio. So. So wait, how many calories did you say you have to eat today? I'm trying to eat 4,000 a day now, but it's extremely hard, and a lot of it. God. Yeah, it's I hate eating, so it's not. You know, some people like love eating. They're like, I want to eat more, but I like don't like eating anything. So to eat that much is just. Yeah. Like, yeah, I can understand how that's like actually a burden. So you have to eat like a lot of peanut butter and stuff like that, huh? Yeah, I mean, I should. I, yeah, I always wanted to be like like the best super healthy calories, but what I end up doing with peanut butter is putting like three servings in my one of my protein shakes, and mm -hmm. I eat a lot of uh, I eat a lot of nuts because you know I guess the guy we've had on a podcast a couple of times, Sean Lafort, he's a PLO player, he's really big into fitness. He recommended a lot of nuts for those like easy healthy calories to get. So. You have the opposite problem that a lot of women have, I suppose, where they're like trying to find things that are filling that don't have a lot of calories in them. Exactly. They're to find things that like aren't very filling and have a lot of calories in them. Are you are you one of those people that's like into the diet, into the workout type of stuff and all that? I do. I love. I mean, I just love working out. Unfortunately, I don't actually feel like working out usually makes me lose weight, which is kind of frustrating because I still love it. I love the adrenaline rush, the endorphin rush. I love the way it makes me feel. I do CrossFit. Um, my brother actually got me into that as well, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, it's like I love it, but um, I feel like sometimes I overcompensate by eating even more because you know, like when you're working out a lot, you just want to eat a lot. So sometimes I think like it doesn't necessarily make me look leaner, but it's like I'm still gonna do it because mm. it's it's healthy, and eventually I feel like I'll figure it all out. Eventually I'll figure out how to like work out and eat the perfect amount. Eventually, that's like the dream we all have. We want to figure out that perfect balance of what we. Yeah, need. yeah. I mean, I do think I'm getting better. Like, you know, I I learn like little things every every like couple months that like make the the whole combination a little bit easier. And it's definitely better, I think, to err on the side of exercising too much, even if you feel like it, it makes you overeat. I'd rather do that than like try to like look good by like starving yourself because that's not sustainable, you know. Whereas, like, working out and, like, you know, improving your muscles is, like, always going to be better, you know? I think that's what most uh, – that's, like, the standard woman GTO for losing weight is just not eating a lot of food or starving themselves. Yeah, but it's, like, it's so hard to sustain. That's a problem. And then you gain so much – see, that's the thing. When I play in big poker series, I generally, like, lose a ton of weight, which is, like, not an experience that everybody has. But, like, WSOP, PCA, I always lose a lot of weight because, I don't know, somehow when I'm playing poker, I don't want to eat that much. Nervous energy. Yeah. You know, walking a lot. But then I, I snap gain it back, like, instantly. Because, you know, it's all from, like, just not eating very much. It's not from actually, like, you know, exercising, you know. So you kind of find it challenging to maintain a, a proper diet when you're on the road and focusing on yeah. poker. Yeah, and luckily I don't, like, just eat a bunch of junk. I just end up eating less. So it kind of works out in a way, but... So what's, like, your typical, like, food you, you try to eat or you... you do eat, I guess. What's like? What kind of stuff do you do? You, do you have? Well, I love. You mean when I'm on the road? Yeah, when you're on the road. What kind of like? What what kind of diet are you trying to give yourself when you do eat? Mm, I just like um. I just like to eat a lot before I actually. The thing I like about poker tournaments is like I basically just eat whatever I can and eat whatever I want because it's so hard for me to get calories in that it's like like normally I don't eat pasta, for instance. When I go play poker tournaments, I just eat it anyway because it's like, well, I'm gonna lose weight in this tournament anyway, so who gives a who cares, you know? Who gives a care? Who gives a what? Who gives a fuck? I mean, it's like, it just doesn't matter. I can just eat whatever when I play poker. Mm. I don't I don't know why that is. It's like, maybe I, I, chess also. Chess was exactly the same way. It's like, I could never gain weight if I played in a chess tournament. I'd always lose weight, like every single time. Hmm. Women out there, if you're listening, you now you're you're learning some, uh, some secrets from Jen. She says, if you want to lose weight, go play a live exactly. tournament. Go play a chess all weekend, and you're gonna lose some weight. Exactly, just like play chess and poker, and you'll like you'll be skinny. You know, that's that's the uh, that's the that's the rule. At least it's been for me. But then uh, then I have to go into these periods where I just like incubate, and that's where it's challenging. You know, where I like just working on projects and writing, and you know, videos, and uh, you know, just kind of sitting at home a lot. So even though I'm working out more, I just feel like it's harder to, like, you know, prevent yourself from, like, overeating all the time. What kind of uh, other projects, uh, what other stuff do you work on? 
Well, I'm I'm into writing, and then I just do a lot of I do a lot of just like consulting and coaching, um, just like kind of things that help like um, you know just to make more money and also interact with people. So hmm. um, I like that. I think I'd be better at poker if I did none of that and I just like focus completely on poker. But I kind of made a decision at some point that I'd rather. I made a conscious decision that I'd rather um, um, make more money and then when I play poker have to worry um, less about the results, you know? So then, make more um, money at outside ventures other yeah. ways and then that way you're not as much, don't have as much pressure on yourself when you're playing poker. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I do. That's smart. Yeah. I think what you find with most people in poker is that they can't make enough money doing these things outside to sustain a type of lifestyle they want, so they have to put the pressure on themselves to make the money at poker. Whereas it sounds like you, you, you know, you have these, it's pretty, it's pretty cool to have opportunities where you can actually make money outside of poker. Yeah, well, I, my, my goal is, like, basically just to, like, make sure that I'm making enough money from, like, you know, either, like, either all the ventures outside poker and kind of the ones that are more steady in poker, like the steady income from, like, you know, playing medium stakes open face games or from like you know doing work for poker stars and one at once and then at the same time you you know you're really searching for that big hit to make you rich so like make sure that you have enough always to do everything you need to do and then also like just kind of like throwing some darts to try to like make the big hit yeah and I think that some people are just trying to do the latter and of course that's not gonna work I mean it might but if it doesn't then you're fucked so yeah, it, kind of, it works for some people. I guess some people look at it, they, they take that approach. Some people also take the, the steady grind up approach, you know, where it's yeah. not like all or nothing. You know, it's they, they kind of realize, like, I have to be here and I have to get here, get here, get here, get here. Yeah, that's a good way to do it, too, totally. I, I, I the grind up. I, I easily could be doing that if I, if I, if I could work more in my life nittiness. You know, that's that's what I need to work on. You, you, keep, you mentioned this. You're not in it. What what exactly are you doing? Uh, you, you, you're into shopping. You're into part. Like what? I didn't I didn't take you as a as a shopping addict slash partier. Uh, not really, but I, I feel like still it's like you know if you really read those that article that came out about Faraz, right? Yeah, the okay. homeless millionaire one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I I'm not like a crazy like I don't spend like insane amounts of money, but I'm really a far away from somebody like like that where he talks about how like. He'll, you know, just always be shopping for like the cheapest options for hotels, you know, within reason. Mm -hmm. But um, he's really like trying to make sure that he can put as much money away for like the next tournament or for like life. And I, that's definitely a really good way to be if you just want to make money in poker. Mm -hmm. But you're, you're, you don't, you're not that way, I guess. You. No, I'm not that way. <laughs> Maybe I mean, and I guess I don't really want to be that way enough. And that's okay for now. I don't want to be that way either. <laughs> I gotta be. I don't. Doesn't sound like I'm trying to like. I like enjoying things and spending money and like doing fun things. So. Yeah. 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 What Kyle say? Ask her if. Uh, ask her if. Uh, what? No, I'm not. Oh, I should actually look at some of these. Where can you play mid stakes open face? Well, basically. Um. Basically, playing open face. Um, a lot of the you can play on Tony Bet. Um, and also, most of the open face action comes from playing people you know on your phone. You know. Mm -hmm. Do you find that guys sometimes might might be more willing to play you because you're okay because you're a woman? I don't want we, we haven't talked about that this type of thing yet. But do you feel like that they might want to be willing to gamble with you because you're a woman? Yeah, I think to some extent, but not as much as people think. Mm. I think not as much as people think. Sometimes people actually don't want to lose to a woman, so it can it can actually be a negative sometimes. No, so they'll. But, um, play, and they'll overall, play. it's overall. I have to imagine it's an advantage. I don't know if I'm as good at a, a lot of. I don't know if I'm as good as other women though at uh, taking advantage of that. I think in general, um, I I could do some work in that area. Yeah. Um, like for instance, um, I was playing in a World Series of Poker circuit event with Jamie one time, and there was a guy flirting with me, and um, um blind versus blind, um. I, he jammed, and I called in a very, very standard spot. And afterwards, Jamie was like, "You know, I'm really surprised you didn't try to find out what he had there." <laughs> like, <laughs> I was just playing it like as an online tournament, and we just happened to be flirting between hands. You know, like I didn't really see it as like part of the game that I would be like, you know, using my gender as much. You know. Do, so. you, do you do you think about that more often now, and potentially opportunities or situations where you can, I guess, 
use that advantage? I don't know. I, I, a little bit, but it, it can really backfire because any you, you know you don't want to think about it too much and over overthink it, right? I mean, one thing I'll say is that like I think when I played the open phase um, tournament in Prague, I I thought a lot longer than some of my opponents, and nobody called me out on it. And I'm pretty sure that 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 to some extent that was like using the fact that I'm female because. I think that they probably would have been like, hey, you know, like make a move a little bit faster if I wasn't. But that game was kind of, that I have to say that tournament was a little bit like Wild West in which there were like a lot of rules that weren't enforced. So I think everybody had to kind of like find their thing that they would do, you know. And you, you did win that tournament, correct? I believe yeah. I saw a, a picture that you you were holding up, you were winning. So what was the, what was the buy-in for that one? Um, 10,000 euro, and I wasn't actually planning on playing that morning, so it was like a super thrilling experience, you know, that was kind of random. I, the reason I didn't, minute. what's that? You just played last minute, and that was that, that was it? Yeah, I thought I was going to, normally I would have played, but I was actually doing this event in London, um, this, I was, I was giving like a speech in London about chess and math and poker, and then I was doing, hosting this girls tournament. So I knew that I was going to be flying into Prague the morning that the tournament started. So I thought like that it's a little irresponsible. I always think like something's going to go wrong, like my flight's going to be delayed or something, or I'm going to be exhausted. So I didn't actually stop for it. But then when I showed up in Prague, I felt like amazing and um, just kind of decided, hey, like I should play in this. Looked at the lineup, it looked okay. Yeah. Good decision. It says you won you won the event for eighty two thousand euro, which is not a not a bad payday at all for something you randomly decided to play that morning. Yeah, yeah, it was great. It was a great feeling. Yeah. Uh, is there is there open face? Is that going to be more of like a popular thing in tournament stops as far as uh, these tournaments type similar? I think, no. I think it's actually really hard to run a tournament format with open face, and that's why it actually worked well for it to be like a high roller where like a lot of these people like didn't really they weren't like super like. Even though you would think that because it's a high roller, people would care more about the roles, I actually found the opposite effect. That like people were a lot of people were rich or too cool to like really be like too nitty about like enforcing every role. You know. What are these, what are these rules that you're mentioning? So what, like, what are some of these rules that you think should like maybe would have been enforced in a different situation that weren't enforced there? I mean, everybody just like kind of took a. Uh, took the tournament director's word for granted. Like, nobody was, like, really... Like, for instance, the reason it's hard to have open face pineapple tournaments is because when people go to Fantasyland, it's just, like, really a bit of a fiasco, you know? Like, mm -hmm. if they go to Fantasyland and they stay, um, you have to figure out, like, w what happens if, like, you know, they started with, like, only 200 chips and um, every open face tournament I've played in has, like, slightly different roles related to that. So basically, like, being a short stack in an open face tournament is a massive advantage, um, much so, uh, much more so than in a regular tournament where it's already, like, an advantage. Um, because if you go to Fantasyland, you can kind of, like, keep doubling up your stack, you know? Oh. Whereas if you didn't, you would just be eliminated. So there's just, like, a lot of weird stuff like that. Well, the only, the only open face experience I have, I played, I was staying at my friend Brian Hastings' house uh, for a couple weeks, and... I played him in open face Chinese, and for anyone that knows Brian, he's slightly uh, good at poker and good at math, so he... Oh, yeah. Brian Hastings, you said, right? Yeah, yeah. He, he like, gave me a couple yeah. beatdowns, and I'm like, I'm never playing this fucking game again. I was like, I'm quitting. <laughs> he, oh, yeah, he's, like, really good at, um... I mean, I think he's very good in, at poker in general, so he's one of those guys who's, like, just going to be good at open face when it starts, and... I, I, you know, make a lot of money from uh, the new games. I admire people like that, like the kind of like Sean Deep types where it's mm -hmm. just like there's a new game and they're just going to make a ton of money from it for the first two months and then it's like on to the next thing. Yeah, I think he was he was there a couple of times. He uh, was at Brian's house a couple of times as well. I was like, man, I'm not like, I'm, I probably should play against people that are slightly more new at this than me because I had no idea what was happening at the game. But it was kind of, it was kind of fun. I enjoyed it. I liked the Fantasyland part of it. That was, that was pretty enjoyable. Yeah, that that is definitely the um the part that keeps keeps people kind of excited about it for sure. Kyle Kyle uh, Kyle Prop in the in the chat actually asked an interesting question about the the cheating. Like, is there cheating possible with mobile? Like, is that something you have to worry about? Is that something you think about when you challenge somebody? And you know, what's your approach to it? Yeah, you have to trust somebody a hundred percent. 
Because if there's even a chance that you're getting cheated, then it's like you're not going to be able to win, you know? <laughs> Unless they're like a massive fish. If you, if you think there's like a 10% chance you're getting cheated, like clearly you run very far away, right? Because you're never going to be able to make up for that. What's um, the what's the cheating exactly? Is there like a, a an app or something? Like I don't understand. A couple of instances, like apparently in very very high stakes Russian games, there is there has been a breach of security on the um, ABC app. Um, I think it I think it was very difficult to um, hack into though, so it's not something that like happened widespread. But um, some some of the very high stakes Russian games lost a lot of money, and I was actually offered action against one of the one of I think one of the Russian cheaters. So. And kind of, and, and you know, something seemed kind of funny about it. Like I'm very proud of that moment, actually, because you know, open face is all about game selection. Somebody offered me some action against this person, and I was just like, you know what, this doesn't feel right. Like I, I, like so, one person told me he's a fish, and another person told me like that he was like the only person that was beating him, and I was just like, this doesn't feel right. So I said no, and turned out the guy was cheating. So mm. worked out. Mm. Um, but. I think it was for some very, very big games, like thousand of point games or something is what I've heard. Oh. So they weren't wasting their cheating on like, you know, smaller games or anything. It was like very big. They were going the uh they were going the ultimate bet style where they just go for the big score. Exactly. Exactly. And they just get out when they're persona non grata basically. Yeah, they're not um, doing it. I it is it is it is a challenge, you know, you need to make sure that you get paid. And when you play these open-faced games, I forgot about games. that too. That's that's got to also got to be challenging as well. Yeah, because there's no rake, right? So that's the good part. You know, you're just playing against another person, but um, you have to make sure that you actually find that person and get your money. You know. Have you have you ran into so, troubles with that then? Um, not really, but it's just kind of like I think you need to be super because a lot of times you're playing people who are kind of friends. So I think it's good to be really really clear about what the terms are. Because sometimes it can be kind of confusing. Like, somebody got mad at me that I didn't know that well because I wanted to get paid at some point. And they were like, well, nobody I'm, everybody I'm playing is, like, too baller to want to get paid this much. And I was like, well, I want to get paid at that. <laughs> so, so wait, I, the, amount, the amount to them wasn't, wasn't enough? Mm-hmm, exactly. Yeah, so it was, like, an insult for me to ask for it. It was like, why are you asking me for, like, this amount of money? Like, come on. Everybody else I play with, that's, like, not very much money. Ay, 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 ay. I hate people. I don't like people like that. But you find a lot of people like that in the vocal world that are... Mm-hmm. Yeah, basically, like, it's all about, like, scale. Because, like, I, as much as, like, I was offended by that incident, I know sometimes there's cases where I might owe somebody a few hundred bucks, and maybe I don't, like, pay them fast enough because I'm not realizing, like, hey, this person, like, it might matter to them. So I think, like, you always kind of have to, like, Look at it from the other person's point of view, and uh, it's not that easy to do sometimes. That's kind of uh, I think that's something I, a skill I learned a couple of years ago. I whenever I think about something, and if I ever say to myself, you know, why is this person doing that? I always try to put myself in in their shoes and, and think about it from their perspective when it comes to anything really. And I feel like that really helps. So instead of you saying like I, I don't understand why that guy would do that, you kind of get a better understanding of why they would do it. Yeah, right. I mean, one thing that my my dad always taught me was that. Um, you can never pay too fast. I mean, you always want to try to pay people as quickly as you possibly can when you owe the money, like, because um, it really builds your reputation. Like, even the difference between, like, just transferring somebody money within 10 minutes after you agreed to something as opposed to, like, an hour, like, that that 45 minutes, they could be kind of, like, sweating it a little bit. Like, wait a second, maybe I really did just get scammed. You never know. So yeah. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a big advocate for that, like, just, like, you know, Try to just like pay people faster than you, faster than they expect to get paid. It's yeah, like, it's a win. I think that's a great. I, uh, everyone out there should definitely adopt that. Although many people aren't going to adopt that, they should be that way. We got a uh, Hargobine says, "Hargo, what's up, buddy?" He says, "Tuning in from the library." Har- I love Hargobine. I love, dude. I love this guy. He, he's my he's my young uh, kind of underage friend. He he always sends me high school. He has a lot of high school girl GTO strategy he wants to share with me, and I I. Far, far too old for that now. So, but thanks for tuning in from the library, Puppy. Uh, JW says, "Puppy, I made it." What's up, man? Thanks for tuning in live. John says, "Do you post in advance when the podcast is going live?" I post in on the Facebook group that links in the description, and I post also on Twitter when I usually give like a day advance, and then I usually give a couple hours advance. So, you guys, if you guys want to see the next live ones, whenever they'll be, I'm not sure when. We got a lot of guests coming up, but I'm not sure when exactly those are going to be. 
Um, let's see. Do you, Judas says, do you plan on switching to P? Oh, he's asking Tim Stone that. Never mind. Um, all right, let me, I'm, I'm cruising up here. I, I didn't really talk about many of the chat comments yet, so I've got to acknowledge some of these fun comments. Somebody asked me about what the average hourly teaching is for a chess grandmaster. Um, it really depends what geographic area you were in, but um, it's probably somewhere between 50 and 150 would be pretty average. Is there like a chess at, chess at once where you like put chess listings on there and you can search by a geographical location and fake find a chess coach or something like that? Well, a lot of the it's just like on it's just like poker. A lot of the teaching is going to be online, and that's why you can get a grandmaster for perhaps fifty dollars an hour because you might be able to find somebody from a country where that money goes a little bit longer. You know. No, that makes sense. Do you do you get a lot of opportunities like that? I honestly don't. I mean, right now I'm so busy with between like um. Between Open Face and Poker Stars and a lot of stuff that I'm doing here at the St. Louis Chess Club, I'm, I, I don't take very many students, you know, but uh, I know people who do, so. Well, as you said, so people make, a lot of people make money that way. That's how they make yeah. a living like that. they got to be grinding the coaching. Exactly, exactly. And so I'm, I'm, I feel like right now I don't do it. I, I still enjoy doing it, so I have a couple students, but I don't, like, um, like seek out new chess students, really. Do, do you play any other do you play any other games besides, uh, like, uh, a board games type of thing, like, besides chess? Not really. Chess, poker, and open face, like, kind of keep me busy. So I, I like, like, scramble and scrabble a little bit, but I don't play, like, a ton. I actually went to a gaming convention this year, though. It was, like, a tabletop board game convention, so, like, I guess Magic the Gathering was one of the things and um, a bunch of other, uh, other type of games like that. Um, I don't even know most of their names, but it was, like, actual board games. I was participating in a couple of panel discussions, and what I was really shocked by was that, in, and I think I'm not as shocked now when I see all these Gamergate things coming up on my Twitter feed, was actually way more sexist and chauvinistic than the poker and chess worlds. So I was kind of like really proud of poker and chess for a minute, and I was like, wow, we've actually come a long way compared to some of these other subcultures, you know? But are they that rude towards women, I guess, in general? And these it other... was more extreme. There was like even fewer women. Um, I think there were like uh, yes, and I think there were fewer women, and like you just could see that like females had like not injected the industry as much, you know. So there were like a lot of you know booth babes, but there weren't as many women who were actually playing. And people were like even more surprised to see women who were involved in like that aspect. So. Yeah, uh, Zach says Zach mentioned a game I actually play, which is Settlers of Catan. I fucking love that game. If anyone wants to see me on the Settlers of Catan streets, guys. Let me know. I'm not going to gamble for a lot of money on that game because I don't really gamble, which people might not believe. But I'll play Settlers of Catan with anybody. You let me know. We'll download the pro. I got the program on my computer. We can play it. Let me know. Get in touch. But yeah, you don't, have you ever tried that game? I haven't, but I've heard it's really fun. Oh, it's just really fun. I don't, I don't know how much necessarily strategy goes into it, but I think it's definitely uh, a lot of fun. I think it's very fun. Do people play chess for money? Foss, Foss. What's up, man? We answered that question. They sometimes play chess for... Wait, actually, I don't know if we answered that. Do people play chess for money? Yeah, do they, like, organize a match? Maybe, I guess, I don't know how much action you get, but are there other people out there who who might do that? Yeah, they do. It's usually not very high stakes. Um, one of the biggest problems with chess in terms of become, if, if it's, like, hurdles to become as popular as a game like um, poker um, is that you can't really play chess for money online. And the reason for that is that chess computer engines are so strong that um, the incentive to cheat it would, would be overwhelming and the game would just not exist. It would be like if you could figure out the perfect decision in every moment in PLO or No Limit, and at the same time play high stakes, um, it would be, um, you know, impossible. The game would die, basically. Mm. And that's what happened with chess in terms of it being playable for money online. Yeah. I think so that's something that never happens to, to our games. Um, I, I think a lot of people think that it will never happen. I'm not quite as optimistic. What, in terms of bots uh, taking over poker in a way? Yeah, like ruining the games, like they've ruined chess. Yeah, hmm. yeah. I mean, I, they haven't totally ruined chess because people still play chess online for fun, but they can't play chess online as an income because of that. You know? Yeah, they can't really compete. I guess even now, there's always programs people can mask in the background that'll that they can run uh, like a chess bot or something like that that'll tell them what to do in a match. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, you can never do it. You can uh, never play like chess for like for like thousands of dollars against a stranger. Again, it would have to be like open phase. Like, you could do it against people that you trust, right. and that, that would be fine, you know. 
uh, Mark, Mark Kennedy, friend of the podcast, guest, one-time guest of the podcast, says, ask her what she thinks about the solvability of open-faced Chinese. Well, yeah, I mean, I do think that open face is is going to be is, is is solvable, especially like the end game situations. Again, that's why you really want to play against people you trust to some extent, you know. Mm -hmm. And then that's also why the game kind of keeps morphing. Like in the beginning, they played open face, and then now we play open face pineapple, and people are starting to play juice to seven in the middle. Because if you keep changing the terms, then it's going to take people. Um, longer to kind of like figure it out and get their computers to work on it with, you know. Mm. So, I'm I'm not gonna be convinced to play the game. So I, I'm I'm kind of like want to play it again, but I'm not gonna like fall for what you're trying to. Uh, I'm not gonna fall for what you're saying because. Is it okay now? Can you hear me now? Okay. I can, I can hear you now. Can you hear me? Yeah, what was that? Um, what did it sound like? Um, like a massive static. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah, so I think sometimes my, my microphone like, uh, acts oh, up okay. and is out. My, uh, I keep looking at my wrist. People, I know people that tune in lately are gonna think I'm some type of like I'm animal. I'm getting into fights with cats or something like that. That's why I hate playing basketball. Is because like the people they like, like my arm and my forearms are just filled with scratches from people. So it's like the, it's the it's the downside of basketball. Obviously, you can break your leg like Greg Merson. You can tear your ACL. But shout out to Greg Merson. Man, he tore his ACL. We had Greg Merson on a podcast recently, and he was talking about playing basketball, and he tore his ACL first time out. So. Oh wow, that sucks. Yeah. You play basketball. I do actually. I love it. I'm not very good, but I love it. Um, yeah, I wish girls would do more stuff like that. You know, like fun exercises. Cause How tall are you? I'm five six. Oh, you're short. Okay. Maybe five five. I feel like I'm five six because I'm like usually like five eight or five nine because of the shoes I wear. You wear a lot of big heels. Yeah, I like being tall. I like the platform. I don't like like the skinny heel that it's hard to walk in, but I like being a few inches taller. You know, mm -hmm. makes you feel more powerful. I agree. I I try to. I mean, I guess I'm pretty tall already, but I I like being taller if I could be taller. But I want to be like six six, but I don't know how to grow a few inches, unfortunately. So. <laughs> yeah, it's easier for women. You know, we got these heels. I know. I'm like, why can't I, why can't I just wear like two inch heels and be six six or I guess that would, yeah. No, no, no. I think you can wear like two in, like like shoes that are like a little bit of a platform that don't look too obvious. I'm pretty sure you can find some of that. I might look into it. I don't know. I don't want to be much taller. You play that. You play basketball. Do you like play often? No, I don't really very often anymore. I mean, I used to when I lived in Brooklyn, there were some basketball courts courts near my house. So I like I would do that like for a workout and sometimes even participate in pickup games, mm -hmm. even though I was like really bad. I was just like, hey, why not? I mean, bad compared to you know the people who are playing the games are very good, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Some people in the chat said that World War Three just started in their headphones because of that static. I guess the static was pretty bad. I apologize for the. Uh, for the best aesthetic. Jonathan, what's up? J Jonathan, why do you have, I know Jonathan from, um, I talked to him pretty often on Facebook, but I didn't know he had four names. Jonathan, Alexis, Rivera, you, you, Rick, uh, I can't even, I, I'm not going to try to pronounce that last name. Joey, do you plan to have a chess match with Jennifer? You see, everyone references the chess thing. They, it's like a big inside joke now, and no one knows. No, I get it. Okay, I get it. We're talking, like, like people, people, some people who know we're talking about know we're talking about, but other people just think that it's an actual chess match that we're that we're referencing when we say play chess. So. Yeah, but now that I told you about how, like, in the in like the 1500s, they used to play chess games, you you realize how far back you're going with this, you know? Yeah, it's. <laughs> There are a lot of old there are a lot of old paintings of like women playing chess against men and that was basically that was a subtext that it was like a legitimate way to date, you know? Mm -hmm. Because if if a woman and a man weren't supposed to like be in a room alone together, but if they were playing chess, it was okay. Wow. I mean, I wonder if you could use that same GTO now in terms of dating, like you invite a woman over to play like a board I mean I 
like, come over and play Settlers of Catan. Come over and play a uh, game of chess with me. Come over and let's play... Uh, what most? I found that most women I meet that are in their 20s don't play many games anymore, though. I think any woman who's, like, over the age of 21 probably knows that when you say, come over to my place and... I think they, I think they should know what that means. Oh, what does that I mean, mean? like, come and oh. have a cookie. What? Come on. Wait a second. What does that mean? Hey, I'm, we're confused around here. We don't, let's act like we don't know what's happening. What does that mean? What do most women think? I don't, know. Like, I don't think I've ever, like, I mean, of course, you assume when a guy asks you to come back to their, their room or their apartment that um, they want to have sex with you. I mean, like, it doesn't matter what else they say in the sentence. Just the fact that they say that. Right? Oh, my God. Okay. I... I I thought there was legitimately uh, reasons people might want to have a woman over to, you know, uh, maybe hang out, maybe talk, maybe get to know a little better. I guess it just depends on context, but um, occasionally. But it's like I, I think it's like it's pretty, it's pretty much a an accepted code word, right? <laughs> okay, I'm, I have to admit I'm semi trolling. Of course, I agree with you. But that's what it means all the time. Anytime you say a woman, you like, want to come over and watch a movie, you want to come over and clean my place, you want to come over and I'll make you dinner. It's basically meaning you want to come around sex. Yeah, I agree. With that. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've never. Like really rarely, if you have like roommates or something, it could be legitimate. I would guess like that's why I'm saying like maybe for kids in college it doesn't apply because like if you, it's like you live in New York and you have a bunch of roommates, but any other contacts definitely. Well, what I found is when I tell other women this, they're like, no, that's not true. They just want to, they just want me to come over and like they just no, they don't want to have sex. They just want to be friends. They want to hang out. They want to talk. I'm like, no, no. No, no, they want to. Have, that's what they're saying. They want to have sex with you. That's that's what they're saying by that. Yeah, yeah definitely. I think there's an instance where that hasn't been true. To think about it, I don't. I don't think. I can't think of any right now. Maybe to play chess. Maybe mm -hmm. to actually play chess. No, I don't think so. I can't. I, because, because, but I, I do think that it's it, it's a good way to like. Um, you know, meet meet a woman. I like I like your idea of like playing chess, but I think it's like has to be like in a coffee shop or a bar or something. You know? What about in a room? I don't know why you're just like not gonna get to chess. <laughs> How fast do you move? Wait a second. You might play chess for a bit first. I mean. Oh, right, right. Yeah. I guess you could play a blitz game. Do you know what blitz chess is? Is that the speed game? Mm-hmm. I used to play yeah. checkers online, and I I only loved playing the one minute time games. I didn't like playing anything else. Yeah. <laughs> you only like playing the one. Don't tell the woman that, though. <laughs> bang, bang. Okay, I won't. <laughs> that you only want to play the lightning chess games. So I shouldn't. Uh, oh, I, most women probably won't have any idea what I'm talking about. I guess if I'm if I'm picking up women at a chess convention. Is there a lot, wait, is there a lot of women down there in this St. Louis uh, chess convention right now? No, unfortunately there's not that many women in chess. Um, St. Louis Chess Club, there are probably more women than average because it's like a really fashionable neighborhood and like chess is kind of hot in St. Louis, but mm -hmm. it's still mostly men. Just like poker, it's pretty much the same percentage of women as there is in poker, so you know that it's pretty low. So are you like the are you like the the the, the redheaded chess goddess in the chess world? Like all the guys are like, oh, who, who's that woman? Like they are they like in love with you? That type of thing. I hope so. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Like I think like that that's kind of like. Uh, what I what I'm going for, you know, with like doing the commentaries and like a lot of the events that I do, that people see me as one of the uh, few women in the world and that they um, look up to me. So yeah, I think that there's a lot of that going on. Yeah, but at the same time, I really wish that there were more women in it. I definitely wish there were more women, both well, in chess and poker. Even though I like benefit, I guess economically from the fact that there are fewer, I still would like to see more. How do you think there's any way to potentially get more women into, I guess we'll start with poker, and then if you have any ideas for poker or for chess, you know, what type of impact do you think you personally could have, if any, and do you have any ideas as far as how you could do that? I think just, like, you can go, like, just try to be more welcoming and nice to women who are, like, getting into the game. And, again, like, it seems like, oh, like, it's so easy for women in chess and poker. Like, everybody's so nice to them and welcoming. I don't really think that's true. I think that you, you the ones who are already successful, people are super nice to. But ones who are, like, just jumping in for the first time, actually, people can be kind of forbidding and suspicious, you know? So, 
like for for instance, like when I started to play poker at first, I feel like people were like kind of suspicious more than they were welcoming. But then once you start to know a few people, people are super welcoming. So I think like for a lot of women in these subcultures, they have like just like a little hurdle to pass through and then it's glorious, right? But at the very beginning, it can be unpleasant. So it's like getting them over that and making them realize that if they do get over that uncomfortableness in the beginning, that there's like a lot of extra opportunities that they might benefit from, you know? Not even in terms of sponsorships, which of course are like not as easy to get now in the United States, um, but just in terms of, um, you know, opportunities like to get into games that might be harder for men to get into, you know, social opportunities, business opportunities. Um, so I think that uh, women, if women were aware of that, maybe they would flock more to these games, right? Because that's what, what men are so jealous of. They look at women and they're like, oh, my God, they have so many more opportunities, you know? But, to do that, you kind of have to have this, like, little hustler mentality to get yourself, I mean, to, you know, in a way you're, you're it's, I guess poker is about exploiting people, but doing that, you know, getting yourself into these games and taking really taking advantage of these situations it's kind of about exploiting people in a way. That's basically how you. I mean, would you agree with that? Exploiting people. So let's well, say you can be. We're going to be me. making. I don't think so because I don't think like, that it's always going to be a zero sum game. Um, you could be um, enhancing the experiences. You know, like there's not as there's not enough women in the poker world, so people will like it when there are more women. So it could be kind of like both parties benefit. Like you benefit and they benefit, right? I think so. That's true. I guess some of the uh, like when it comes to I I know for women selling action, it's it's sometimes slightly more easier for them to sell action. I know some women who they sell action. I I get surprised. I don't want to mention names, but I get very surprised that they sold action for some some things that they sell action for. And I guess when it comes to something like that, it becomes easier to sell pieces and get into games and play things that you might not normally play. I guess if you're on an equal skill level with somebody else, that's a man. Yeah, I guess I would say so. Although I do, like I do think that people are also pretty suspicious, so I think it can go, go both ways. Um, women selling action. I mean, okay, people might want to sweat of them, you know. So that could be like kind of that could be kind of uncomfortable. Like maybe like uh, some guy will like you know try to buy a piece and then like just keep pestering them, you know, or use it as like an opportunity to flirt, which is right. that's, pretty that's, inappropriate. That's what I know. My I know my friend uh, Ebony, who I talk to pretty often. She has that happen where guys will buy action to you know kind of get closer to her or to feel like they're friends with her or something like that. Yeah, to get her phone number, right? Like it's just like a it's like an it's actually a cheap way to get her phone number, and then on top of that, they have a piece of her in the tournament. So it's kind of like that they got like a really awesome deal, you know? Like they, they bought like three hundred dollars they spent like three hundred dollars for like some small percentage over her in something and they have her phone number now. So it's like Yeah. That's uh I I have heard some heard some interesting stories uh, from her on uh, maybe she she could probably talk about those on podcast because she likes coming on the podcast. Did you play uh, in Florida? The no, I didn't. I was like, I was in between trips, and I was going to Prague soon thereafter. But it looked like such a blast. I saw like obviously my good friend Jamie was in it, and like I saw that Ebony and Lily and Vanessa and Danielle. It looked like they had so much fun. So you didn't get to play like, looking at that podcast. I mean, looking at that. Um, did you watch it? I watched a little bit. Well, I'm I just like I'm friends with Ebony, so I I, I watched it out of moral support for Ebony. I had to see if she because she we always talk about poke, we talk about we don't really talk about specific poker strategy, but she always says like oh I'm I'm better at poker than most people think. So I and so I watched a little bit of, of see how she played. Yeah. So what did you think? Were you happy with how she played? Yeah, she plays tighter tighter than I would expect. She's very uh she's a very aggressive person, so I I would expect her to have an aggressive poker style, but she's actually. Um, a bit more tighter than I would have expected. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, it's always hard to tell from just like a few hours of a cash game, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's yeah. not really that many hands that she got, she got probably. Yeah, we did something at the Borgata in um, some type of announcing thing together, and we I saw her play a bit of live poker, too, and, and she was, like, tight there, too, so I was like, yeah, I was, I was confused, man. You think Ebony, she's, like, wild. She's got, like, pink, purple hair, and she's very uh very loud so well that's good maybe maybe she gets a lot of action that way because it's kind of like people think that she's going to be really aggressive and then she actually plays tight but when she actually when she plays a hand people still can't get the stereotype out of their head 
Um, you know? I, might, I might be sharing way too much strategy on her part now. Oh, man, sorry. Yeah. Been, now I might have, might have ruined that many strategy. <laughs> Well, I do love the I did love the red hair that she brought for the uh, the Poker Night in America. That was pretty awesome. Have you uh, have you played at any of the Poker Night in Americas? I haven't yet. No, but I'd like to. It looks like it'll be it'll be a lot of fun. Yeah, and yeah. I like how they're trying to bring in a lot of women to it as well. Seems yeah, people will be the female players are going to be tight. So it's kind of interesting because you get like a lot more attention. So like even if you just like fold like just a few hands, people already notice it. Whereas if you were a guy and you folded a few, if, like an orbit of hands, like just nobody would even notice, you know. So it's it's kind of a really interesting experience being a female playing poker. And then if you play a hand well or like really aggressively, people also like hyper notice that too, and they think you're completely wacko, even if it's like only one hand and like a couple orbits, you know. So what what would your so, play style be considered? I'm pretty tight generally. I mean, like most of the tournaments I play, and I think that, that that's a good good strategy. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Do you, do you think you have a good understanding of, of what people at the table might, uh, how they might perceive you, and I kind of have a good understanding of how to potentially take advantage of that in real time while you're playing with them? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of tricky sometimes because I don't know, like, what people know about me. Like, if they just see me as a girl or whatever, or if they know that, like, I'm also, like, a chess player and everything because it really changes things a lot, you know? Like, I remember once playing in, like, some Borgata main where, um, a guy made like a super tight fold about against me. Then the the tournament was reported on on the blog, and like literally like one level later, um, we had another big pot, and he made like like a kind of like insane um, five bet preflop, which um, was like the exact opposite of what he had done earlier, you know. And I, they had reported on the blog, and they mentioned like my chess credentials and everything, you know. So like his image basically changed so. Um, so drastically within like one hour, and obviously he hadn't seen that many more hands that I played. So it can so, uh, yeah, it can so, kind of change really quickly. Just generally, it changes a lot more quickly. Like people are willing to make um, new assessments of a woman much more quickly. I think you know. So I guess they go into it thinking maybe something right away, and then they immediately, as you play a hand, or if you fold a lot, of, fold a couple hands, or if you play. Mm -hmm. Three bets, they immediately will just make a snap change quicker for you, whereas for someone else, they might not do that. Probably, yes, exactly. And a lot of that is just because they're paying more attention to you. So, like, they're, they're like, hyper-focused on you, and then on other players, they're, like, less focused. So, like, anything that you do is going to be amplified in their brain, almost like it happened, like, five times, even though it actually only happened once. That's kind of, like, how I, I think of it, you know? You kind of... So I guess it's a skill for a woman to be really aware that that's what's going to happen, and then mm -hmm. I guess maybe potentially figuring out how to take advantage of that for your benefit. Exactly. I guess that that is, yeah, that's it. That's that's huge. Yeah. Pretty big thing. I mean, that's something that you know. I don't think I think most people don't necessarily. I think. Uh, well, I think you find something like that with the more name players. They probably have to Similar. be more aware of, of how people might be playing differently against them just because of who they are, too. So I guess that's kind of something that, you know, cuts it. That's, uh, there's really no way to get better at that either. Yeah, I mean, it's just like it just like if you're playing against a famous name player and they play a hand badly, it's going to, like, just stick out in your brain so much, you know? Or if they play a hand really well, that's going to also just, like, you know, imprint itself in your brain way more than if it was just like an average Joe who you don't recognize, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, Allie Bro, what's up, man? He says, hello, puppy. Who is this lovely lady? Her name's Jen. She's uh, a term player. She's also, I like calling you a chess champion. She's a chess champion, which is like, you All know, right, we, don't have, we don't have chess champions on the podcast every day. It's pretty sweet to have a chess champion on. And um, yeah, poker player, writer, chess champion to sum her up in five words or less. Uh, Mr. Greg Moore, he says, God damn, I've been checking loads over the last few days for new content on this channel, and I missed this podcast. I will have to watch and start later. How do I post this on Facebook, Joe? You can, the uh, Facebook link in the description, Greg. You can join the group, uh, if that's what you're asking. If you want to post something else, you can post in there too, I guess. Um, yeah. Uh, Jamal says, chess players approach poker more GTO-wise, question mark, not exploitatively. I think you mentioned that earlier. I do think so, actually. Well, I mean, I think that will come more naturally to them, and that's actually why, like, maybe 
I'm kind of getting more interested in No Limit as like watching like how the game is kind of changing towards going more in that like GTO direction, especially online. I think that actually like benefits me more like playing around with programs like um, Card Runners EV or Holding Resources. It feels like home to me. Like that just feels like oh that's what I was doing for chess for like so long, you know. Yeah. Um, and some of the other things like just come like a lot less naturally to me. So these like I think the fact that these aspects are like becoming much more prominent in the game are really good for chess players. Do you, do you uh, talk to a lot of uh, do you talk a lot of poker with people in terms of like I guess like GTO strategies? I'm not even sure how prevalent those are. I don't even know if those are prevalent in tournaments. I don't know if people are necessarily think if that's something that exists in tournaments. I know it exists a lot in no limit cash. I don't think it's necessarily exists as much in PLO cash right now, but I'm not sure how what like term player standpoint is on that. I think it's really interesting. I mean, I don't, I guess because playing tournaments is only one of the things I do. I don't like, I, I watch a lot of videos and run at once and I get some coaching and stuff. And I do talk with my friends whenever I go to tournaments, but it's not like something I live and breathe every day. And also I'm in this kind of like weird situation, which I think a lot of women are in poker and chess and that I think that a lot of the people that I'm friends with are better than me at poker. So it's like, I don't like to kind of like pester them all the time with like a bunch of like hand history stuff, you know? Just like. I'm going to share some strategy with people out there that are listening to this right now that I don't talk strategy ever and it has to do with that exact thing you just said. Yeah. What what I've actually found is that if you're, it, it, it doesn't have to be about poker, someone that's better than you at anything. It kind of mm -hmm. like if you, if you explain to them or if you let them know like, hey, like, you know, I think you're better than me but I, I'm, I'd like to learn, I'd like to get better. When you ask questions, like even poker questions, there are people that ask me PLO questions, but they've explained, like, you know, I'm actively trying to get better, I want to learn. I don't necessarily look at them as pestering me. I look at them as, you know, this guy's genuinely in shit, he genuinely wants to know, and I'm much more apt to help them out. And I found that if you just present yourself like that, people are much more willing to just, you know, like, they don't look at it as pestering, they look at it as like, oh, this is kind of, like, I enjoy doing this, I enjoy helping that person out. Yeah, I think to some extent, like it's just like you don't want to abuse that. Just like if I'm friends with somebody, I wouldn't want them to be texting me like chess hand histories all day, you know? Because it's like, well, I do get paid for that, you know what I mean? But if they yeah. if they do it like occasionally, I'm like excited to kind of share knowledge with them. That's yeah. all. I, I don't know. I think that people can be kind of protective over their knowledge actually in general. Yeah, I don't know. Especially now. now. I love sharing information. Let's make a Twitch stream three hours a day, and we're going to tell you how I play poker and share all my strategies with you. People yeah. poker, they love giving it away. It's, they, That's true. That's true. But do you think the best players are generally doing that? Sometimes. I, hope, I, I don't think so. I know. I know. Uh, I hope. I mean, I'm obviously very anti-strategy. I think it's retarded. I guess mm -hmm. I think it's dumb when people are playing at a high level and performing high at a high level, and then they give away how to play play for free. Wait. Are you back? I think we're back. I'm back. I think you lost. I I lost you, I think. Oh, okay. I just threw error. I don't know what even that means. But okay. Well, we were saying something about uh. Oh yeah, the people uh sharing strategy, right? Yeah, and I mean, like, I got um. I, I guess I got. I didn't really get as much heat as I expected for doing run at once videos on open pace. I thought like people would be more annoyed at it, and like people would be mad at me and say stuff to me. Um, but in the end, like, nobody really said anything, and I was like, I obviously had my reasons for doing it, but I understand yours as well. Do you, your reasons for, so your reasons for doing it, I guess, obviously, are money, right? Not really. Well, kind of, but, like, I mean, it's complicated, no, because I could no, lose no, money no, from people thinking, like, I'm going to get a little less action. You know, I'm making these run at once videos, so people are like, well, obviously, she's good. I'm not going to play her for money now, you know? So I'm not sure if it's like 100% great for money for me, but I knew that if I made these videos, I'd, I'd have to study a lot for every video that I made, you know, and that would make me better. You mentioned that earlier, that you, you kind of, like, when you start making those videos, you kind of got, like, re-excited about Yeah. Videos. So it actually helped you out, I think. Yeah, and I think to some extent it was also, like, a bit of a feminist thing because I saw that there were, like, zero female coaches on Run It Once, and I was like, ah, oh, you know, like, they're interested in me being a coach, and that's kind of, like, an honor since it's, like, the best website. Um, so, like, that definitely mattered to me because I know, like, when I was first starting to play No Limit tournaments and I was a Deuces Cracked member, um, Vanessa was, like, the only female coach, and, like, it, it did kind of matter. Like, 
it was nice to be able to hear a female voice once in a while, you know? Mm -hmm. so, so that was definitely part of it as well. And then, um, yeah, I can see the I can see the other side. I can see why people could be legitimately annoyed, and that's fine. But it's like it's always going to be like you're going to be helping some. You're going to be taking money from some people and giving money to other people, right? Mm -hmm. So, like somebody, somebody's going to lose and somebody's going to win, right? I guess that's uh, when I mean, it comes to like that. You argue with a game like Open Face, though, that you're popularizing the game. I don't think you could make that argument for something like PL or No Limit. Maybe you could, though. Maybe you could say that you're, by, by introducing people to these complicated concepts that they can't actually execute, like, for instance, you watch, like, Ben Selsky talk about, like, folding quads or something, um, that by introducing them to these kind of fascinating intellectual things, they're going to want to play poker more and for higher stakes, even though they can't actually execute the concepts and might actually be um, injecting more money into the poker community. I think that's, a, that's plausible. And, and that's an argument I've had for why to potentially stream PLO on Twitch is that the idea of introducing people to the game in general, and, and you make actually a really great point, is that if you introduce them to like these, I guess, you think that, okay, so the people that could actually take this knowledge and then use it well probably aren't going to watch this, but the people that are watching it are going to just hear this knowledge and not actually know how to execute it, but it's going to make them want to get better, learn more, put more money into poker, and then because of that, they'll start playing more, losing more, winning more, or whatever, but just playing more in general, which is actually a good point. It's something I, uh, I haven't thought about. Yeah, I think it's true to some extent. The question is, like, in the end, like, people, there will be, like, a general upward trend of people getting better, but maybe it keeps the game more popular than we think, you know? I'm not so sure. I'm, of course, I don't think that people are intentionally doing that. Like, I'm pretty sure that, like, these guys are not, like, intentionally making a really complicated video hoping to deceive people. Like, no way. Certainly not Matt Sosky, but... <laughs> it's an idea. Quite interesting. It's an idea. I think it's called... It's an idea. It's interesting. Uh, Greg says, you could write a book and leave your name off of it. That way people wouldn't know who the player was, and you would make some money. If a book has the word advanced in the title, it will sell. Hmm. I don't know if that's in general or if that's... Uh, yeah, he was referencing what we were talking about. Yeah. So you've only wrote one. You wrote only one book, Chess Bitch, which is quite an interesting name. Yeah. So I I wrote Chess Bitch and I wrote Play Like a Girl. So both of them kind of coming, um, like with like different feminist messages. Play Like a Girl is more for kids, you know, coming up in chess that they would uh, see all these combinations executed by female grandmasters rather than the old ones that are copy pasted from famous games of men. And then Chess Bitch was more like. Uh, Again, like kind of like uh, an exploration of women in the world of chess, and you know, w why are they playing? Why are they not playing? And how does it change, like, from different countries and different cultures? I would say, though, like, I definitely like, like, so people because of my history and all the work that I do for women and girls, like, um, I, I definitely um, have like a reputation as a feminist. But I think there are some opinions that people are then surprised by. You know what I mean? Like. I'm not, it's not like everything I think is like hyper feminist, you know, none of us are perfect, so. What are, what would be like one specific thing that people might be or have been surprised by that you might say or think that they, would, they wouldn't have thought that? Well, I definitely think that men, I think it's totally fine for men to pay for dates, for instance, and people are surprised by that. Um, oh. I definitely think that women gain a lot from being, like, you know, when I when I was uh, annoyed at you for that interview with Jamie Kurtzstetter, it's not that I like disagreed with your point as much as like the um. It, it is that it? Yeah. yeah. Right. So it's not like I'm like I I think like oh you know it's like so hard for women in poker and chess. Again, I think it's more nuanced than that. I think it's like starting at, starting out it's maybe harder in some ways. Um, but once you're in, it's probably easier and better. So it's like. I, I think of myself as like being pretty pragmatic in a lot of those things, you know. Well, what, what would be what would be one other thing? So, paying for I guess yeah, that is the feminist a way to think is that women should pay for their own dates or pay for, yes, pay for their own yes. parts. A lot of people are surprised that like I think like that I think that it's okay like for for women for men to pay for things for women in that respect, and that's because I think that generally in order to be like. Um, an attractive woman, and especially in American society, you have to spend a lot more money than men, you know? 
Definitely. I'm not sure if this is true in Europe. It's funny, actually. I was talking to, like, Fedor and his roommate about that, and they were arguing that in, like, a lot of European countries, that's not the case, that men spend, like, a lot of money on clothes and, like, their their look. Uh -huh. But certainly in the United States, women spend, like, so much more money. Oh, my God, it's not even close. I mean, you can imagine what women spend money on, like, nails, waxing, makeup. It's, like, crazy. And, of course, like, they don't have to do any of that, but then it's, like, you're probably not going to be attracted to them and want to want to take them on a date, you know? That's pretty true. That's a really good point. Um, Max. What's up, Max? Future guest of the podcast, Max Chiswick. Max lives in Israel, too. You mentioned your boyfriend lives in Israel. He's from Israel. I know Max. Yeah, Max is a, actually friend, was friends with my brothers back in the day. Um, I think they both played sitting goes oh, a long cool. time ago. Yeah. And um, I, I met him in Israel, actually. Did you? What did you, yeah, yeah. you think about him when you met him there? Oh, it was, it was great. It's great meeting other, other Israeli um, poker players. Well, I, yeah. well, poker players who live in Israel. Rather. And I actually, I, when I play on Poker Stars, um, they, 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 I have the spade next to my name because I'm an ambassador, and it actually has the Israeli flag. So when I played in the PCA, there were so many Israelis coming up to me and like, saying, like hey, we were watching you like deep in the Supersonic yesterday. Mm -hmm. And it, like, made me feel really proud in a way. And also, like, it made me feel, like, a tiny bit bad because, like, I don't live there year-round. But, um, it, like, it's, it's really cool. Do, uh, do you find that a lot of women come up to you and talk to you from chess? Like, or they have conversations with you, they want to pick your brain, or they want to get to know how they can get involved in chess more? Yeah, not as many as you would think. Um, you know, but, um, yeah, I, I have women kind of, like, asking me for advice in poker and chess, yeah. Hmm. I would think you'd be like a person like that some people might I don't know, you kind of seem approachable but at the same time you, you seem like you might be unapproachable for some women because you kind of have like a you have a little, th you have like a what's the word, like a thug, you have thug I want to say thug life, that's not what I'm thinking about but you kind of, you know what I mean, does that make sense? You kind of have like a little a little aura about you that for some people might be they might feel scared to approach you Oh, that's funny. Yeah, I don't, I don't think of myself as intimidating, but I guess it's always possible. I mean, the thing is, it's all about whether people like are trying to wait. I, I am like, somewhat protective of my time, so it, like really depends. I think like it's just about how you ask a question. You know, the best is like if somebody shows that they like are actually interested in you and some of the stuff that you've done, it's always going to go a long way. You know. That's that's what I said earlier. That GTO about asking people that are better than you at something for advice. You always you always act very interested in them, and yeah. well, even if you might not be, and that's how you can. Well, that's actually, te I'm going to teach uh, people how to become friends with people. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, intense. if you just ask them, like, hey, like, if you just ask them, like, a really long email asking them just, like, for a bunch of free advice, they're not going to be as receptive. Mm -hmm. This is the, do you know who Star's Rec Problems was? Did you ever communicate with that guy on Twitter? I don't think so. I, I, I mean, I definitely, I don't know if I followed him or if I just, like, saw other people retweet him all the time. I think I did follow him. Mm -hmm. Um he disappeared now because he scammed. He scammed our our Chilean friend Alexo for some money. But he was really good at this. He he would he would um, develop interest in something about you and then use that to form a friendship with you. And that's how he set up yeah. the, his scamming operation where he had his he was taking money from people. Yeah, I mean, I one thing I'll say I don't want to name names, but like I think that a lot of times there have been people in the poker world who are like known as scammers or people say like this guy is a scammer, this guy is like a hustler. And then when you meet them in person, they're so charming. And, of course, like, it's logical because, you know, why would they be successful in scamming so many people if they weren't, like, super charming, you know? But yeah, it's still, like, disarming to, like, to suddenly feel like, oh, wait a second, like, I, I could be a victim of this, you know? Mm -hmm. That's what makes them, them good at that, is that ability to, to make you think that, make you like them, make you think they're charming or they're sweet or they're nice or they're caring. Oh, uh, somebody said actually attractive and good-looking women look good even without makeup and expensive spending. Well, yeah, lives, I mean, all say that. Nancy lives in Finland. He he sees he might be a little bit sway, sway in his opinion. He's meeting those nice northern European women up there, so. He, yeah, uh, with like born with perfect skin, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there are some women who look really good without makeup and don't need to like spend any money on their looks and are still gorgeous. But uh, you'd be surprised at like how somebody can be transformed, like, by, uh, that's why it's, like, such a massive industry, right? Right. I mean, definitely, when you see some women that are, how different they look with makeup on, it's quite, uh, it's quite startling, actually. Yeah, really. 
I'm trying to. I'm going on Ansi's uh, Facebook. I want to see the kind of girls he has in his, in his pictures on here. To the probably a bunch of like Northern European Finnish looking girls who are all they all look a certain type of way. I really want to move to Northern Europe for a little bit of time. I think I might at some point in time. What's SRP? SRP. Uh -huh. Oh, he's the guy I was talking about. Star, his name was Stars Rig Problems. Oh, Stars Rig Problems. Okay, right, of course. Yeah. yeah SRP. Rest in peace, RSIP. We know you're. We know you're out there listening, buddy. We know you're out there. Uh, please don't scam anybody. Please don't be faking a new account on Twitter pretending to be a woman and catfishing people, my friend. <laughs> oh, was that when he was winning, or was that somebody else? Um, no, no, he wasn't doing that, but I predicted that's what he's going to be doing to come back. Cause he disappeared completely after he got outed as a scammer. So I assume he's going to uh, be in some point in time. Uh, okay, guys, if anyone has any questions for Jen, go ahead and ask them. We'll take a couple more, and then we're going to wrap things up. Nor says, what do you say? He said, I'm a chess champion. That's true. When I said you're a chess champion, some people could say I'm a chess champion as well, depending on your viewpoint of chess. I could definitely be considered a world, uh, a world champion in chess. Somebody asked me about my TED Talk. Yeah, I gave a TED Talk last year on chess and decision making and poker. It was really fun. Oh, yeah. How was that? That that's that's a pretty fucking cool thing. That's like quite a is that I think that's an accomplishment, right? Oh yeah, definitely. Especially in like cool. um it was definitely an accomplishment. It was really nerve wracking. So Well I asked that because I read that there's like two TEDs and one is easier to be a speaker at. I don't I don't know much about it. I didn't look much into it, but is that I don't I, is that true? Yeah, I was at the easier one, but still it's like um, oh, okay. but you got to be like, you got to like be some, be doing something right to be uh, invited to do that, right? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, it's really, it was really cool. Yeah. How um, did the whole process? Public like, speaking is one of the most common fears that anybody has, and even though I've done a lot of it, I was still really terrified. So it was good to kind of like just like get over that completely. How did you get invited to that? What was the process for you to be included? Um, somebody like somebody nominates you. Uh, time. I mean, you can also apply, but in this case, I was nominated. So. I'm look. I just put the video up. I'm looking at some of it. Wow, there's quite some interesting comments in the chat here. Oh, wow. Have you read the comments on YouTube in your free video, your TED talk? Um. Yeah. For the most part. I mean, there's obviously. I think there's like a couple haters, but mostly it's nice, right? No, oh, they look pretty good. I mean, there, there's actually some like longer ones, but they uh they look pretty good though. Yeah, I used to. I feel like I used to have more haters on like in general. I don't know if like the internet's just becoming a little less trolly or something. But um, yeah, it's it's or maybe I just don't notice it as much. Also, you know, I feel like at some point you just get kind of like. What about you? Like you get a lot of negative comments from time to time, but don't you notice it less the more? I don't know. I mean, I don't, I, not really. I mean, I used to get a lot back in the day, but these days, even on like two plus two on the YouTube chat on Twitter, like not really. Even but they, when they, someone does say something negative, like I don't, I don't think much about it. I think you gotta have confidence in yourself when you put yourself out there in something like this. You gotta realize there's gonna be negative things said. You gotta expect it, and when people say it, you gotta be able to handle it. Otherwise, you shouldn't be doing something like this because you shouldn't be putting yourself out there in any platform because there's gonna be a lot of negativity thrown your way. Yeah, and it's like when I wrote when I when I put out the book Chess Bitch, of course the title is very controversial and like some people were really angry. You know, but that's also the reason that it sold better than it and that I got a lot of opportunities and like speaking events for it, whereas if I called it like women in chess, like you know, nobody would give a fuck about it. So it's like I think that um yeah. You know, if you're if you're putting yourself out there and like trying to take some risks, you're gonna get haters. So there's definitely some truth in the fact that um, if you're successful, you're just going to have more haters. So you find that now that you don't necessarily get that much uh, negative feedback from that standpoint then? I think I still get negative feedback. I feel like more of it is, um, uh, I don't think it's like on public message boards as much though. You know, I feel like it's, it's more like behind corners. But again, it's just whenever you succeed, you get more negativity. You know? So I feel like it's a positive. If you, you mean like you're from getting people saying, what's that? You mean like from uh from like people you know or like behind your back sort of thing? Yeah, but not a not a ton, not a lot, but you just get like a little bit, you know? And that's good. Well, I, I mean, I per I gotta be honest. I personally love it because that shit motivates me so much. I'm actually not very motivated anymore. But the time I was most motivated was when I was getting the most neg like the most hater. Like there used to be some called poker table ratings on um. There used to be a website that tracked cash game results. And I was never really known for my results. I was known for just playing a lot of hands. So there'd be a lot of people like, oh, you, you, you can't win at poker, yada, yada, yada. And that motivated me 
like an immense amount, and um, I, I think you can really channel that negative feedback into extreme motivation levels. Agreed. That's exactly what you should do with the negative feedback, you know? Mm -hmm. that, and so you should see it as a blessing, but sometimes people just get obsessed, especially if they're not used to it, you know what I mean? Oh, it can be hurtful. I mean, on the internet, people are calling you ugly. They're calling you get you, you get a too fat ahead. You got you're too fat. You're too skinny. You're fucking weak. You know, they just say there's so many things, ways, different ways to attack a person, and it's hard not to just not care. You know, it's hard to be like, oh, I don't care. Like it's, you know, what I'm saying. It's hard to not let those type of things affect you. Yeah, especially because there's always something. Like everybody has something. You know, it's like women. A lot of times, it's their weight, but not necessarily. You know. Everybody has something that, that bugs them more than anything else, and if, like, some random internet poster hits on it, even mm -hmm. if, even though it's a random person, it's going to bug you. Yeah. yeah. Especially with women. I mean, there's, like, um, like some of these, like, you know, some of the threads on 2 plus 2 about women, there's always, oh, she's, she's, like, they say so much, they say so much stuff. It's, uh, I can see that'd be pretty scary for a woman to come in there and want to open yourself up to these type of uh, feedback from people in the poker world. Yeah, yeah, especially because there's a lot of times there's jealousy because of this perception that it's so much easier for women in polka, mm -hmm. you know? So then yep. people are more hateful, but not in person, more like behind their backs or on, on anonymous internet forums. Okay, of course, 2 plus 2 is not anonymous, but still, it's not the same as like actually being offensive to a woman to her face, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, most people aren't the same way in real life. They're not going to say something to you mean in real life as though. <laughs> You um, somebody that. actually asked me an open face that I had in history. He says, um, we get ace, queen, eight of spades, king of diamonds, queen of hearts, and I'm out of position, so I'm first to act. Is it too aggro to set queens up top? I mean, actually, I think it's really, it's, it's, it's pretty close. Like, when everybody started playing pineapple open face in the beginning, I assume you're talking about pineapple, because obviously in, like, regular open face, it would be, like, um, way too aggro. But, like, in pineapple, people just, like, automatically would be putting the queens up top in the beginning. And it's definitely not losing that much, I, th I don't think. Um, but it, the question is whether it's, like, a bit better to play it nittier and just put, like, the queens with the eight in the back, the ace in the middle, and the king up top. Um, and, yeah, this one is, this one's, like, uh, pretty close. Like, I think there's a lot of different options for the hand. I'm trying to think how uh, I would I would do that one. I don't so what most people do queens up top and then ace on the bot a bottom and king in the middle. I think a lot of people with that hand um, would put yeah they could put like queens up top and then just put like the king the ace and the king in the middle because you're probably going to be able to qualify that. If they were if they put the queens up top, that's what you should do. Just put the ace and the king and then like put like the eight in the back or something and just try to make two pair. Um, but there's a lot of other ways to play it. You could also just go for the flush. And then put the um, the king in the middle and the queen up top. I feel like that's a little too nitty, though. I, I, I kind of like don't like that because you're also one of your queens is already dead, which makes it annoying. I know I most prefer just to put the king and the queen up top and the spade flush in the back if I'm going to do it that way, or just put the queens with the eight and then the ace in the middle and the king up top. If anybody who watches my run at once videos knows that I'm always leaning towards sets where we put pairs in the back over flushes, so. That would probably be like what I would um, what I would think about doing. Um, so the the thing that people underestimated in the beginning is that you can take a gamble and go for Fantasyland like from the first move, and you're gonna qualify most of the time. But that doesn't mean that you weren't gonna you weren't gonna get the Fantasyland just by playing Nittier. So it's like you can play like a massive knit and still get the Fantasyland a lot because that's the nature of pineapple. I'm not gonna be con you're convincing me to want to play again. I'm not gonna fall. Don't do it, guys. Don't do it, please. Somebody asked me how much fun Ronaldo was at the PCA. I played in the uh, the shark cage, and uh, I'm not allowed to say how it went, but um, some of the people who were with me were Ronaldo and Tito Ortiz, so it was like um, it was really fun. Both of them were in the same shark cage. Yeah, yeah, it was me, Tito Ortiz, Ronaldo, the football legend, um, Jake Cody, and Sam Grafton, and the qualifier. Seems like quite the soft lineup from a TV standpoint. <laughs> what are you trying to say about Jake and Sam? Uh, I'm not trying to say anything about them. Yeah. <laughs> no, they're great. They're fun, too. It was it was really fun, obviously. Yeah, of course. I mean, like, in a, a lot of the... I don't... Have you watched Shark Cage? I watched, um, like, one episode of it, but it, I don't, like, watch much Millimet. 
on TV besides the main event? It's pretty, it's very entertaining. I mean, you probably watched the Miss Finland hand, right? I saw the Miss Finland hand, yeah. What did you think of that? I thought it was fun. I thought, like, <laughs> it was funny. <laughs> it was a very funny hand. She, you know, it's kind of like from that standpoint, when you play against a fun player in that situation, you just assume that they're only going to be doing that with a very strong hand and not going crazy, so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I thought Ronnie... Like the way he behaved later, like he really, um, he really showed a lot of class. Because especially like once you play in it, you realize like there's so little time in between hands. So like he had no time to recover or to like detail. And like I feel like he just like came right back with his personality intact and just like you know being kind of like funny and chill. Yeah. If you guys are interested in this hand, you can Google uh, Miss Finland. I believe Miss Finland uh, poker bluff. And uh, the first thing, the first video on YouTube that you can find will be the hand where Miss Finland uh, bluffs Ronnie Bardu on the on the cage. Yeah. Sure. For those of you who haven't seen it yet, I feel like most people have seen that hand. But yeah, she was at the PCA as well. Um, nope. so, yeah, I think she's one of those people who looks even better in person, just like absolutely stunning. And she seems like she's serious about the game. Like I see, I see keep her, uh, I see, I, I see her popping up at like a lot of different spots, um, stops, you know. Uh oh, means we gotta get her on a podcast now. <laughs> yeah, that would be a good one to work on. Yeah, see if she can buff you on the podcast. We haven't had a, yeah, we haven't had a, a we have a chess champion on now, but we haven't had an actual like pageant winner on podcast yet, so that might be some type of uh, podcast bucket list goal to have. Yeah. Um, what did Sam, what did they say? All right, we'll take a couple more questions, guys, and then um, I'm going to wrap it up. I'm going to eat. Sammy says, would you, rather, would you rather have to always say everything on your mind or never speak again? I'm pretty sure you'd say everything always on, you'd say everything always on your mind. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. I would say. Although I, I, I might drive people crazy, so that's the problem. You, know? you drive people crazy? I mean, it would kind of like try to freeze it. But uh, yeah, that, I'd definitely rather say everything in my mind. Not speaking again, I think that would that would make me insane. Does it make a feminist angry that kings are stronger than queens? No, no, I'm not that like I'm not that intense. I mean, actually, though, it is really nice for teaching little girls chess that the queen is more powerful than the king. It really helps. You know, I feel like it's like it makes it so easy to tell them like, hey, you should play this game. Because the queen is the most powerful chess piece on the on the board. Huh. Yeah, it has a lot more mobility than the king. Um, it didn't always though. Like his, that's what what makes chess so fa fascinating from a feminist point of view. That um, it used to be that the queen was the weakest piece on the board, and then like simultaneously with the rise of queens in Europe, um, they queen just became the most powerful piece. So kind really? of crazy. That's how the queen became to be like this. This uh, wow, it's really. I mean, those are not directly related. It's not like they modeled the queen after Isabella or something. It's just kind of coincidence. But people think you know, it's it's kind of like an uncanny coincidence, right? Uh, the real reason was that like chess was just like a bit too slow, so it was a general improvement in the rules for the um the queen to become stronger. Because you can imagine, it's like there wasn't enough aggressive aggressive tools in chess. So the game would take like hundreds of moves, like 300 moves, you know, almost like if you couldn't like you you know you you couldn't like check raise a straight or something like there's just fewer ways to get the money in, you know. Mm -hmm. There's fewer ways to attack your opponent's king because your pieces aren't as powerful, you know. So they um, so, developed this piece that was yes. And they just happened to choose the queen to become like the super powerhouse of the board. And now, instead of the game lasting hundreds of moves, it lasts like 50 moves. Mm -hmm. So it's like much easier to, to play. Uh, ben says, who wins between you and your brother? Um, he, we actually, actually um, just played a game um, where we combined burpees and chess. So I challenge you to check it out. So Greg's really into CrossFit. He, okay, I will tell you a spoiler that he won the game, but still go, go watch it. Um, CrossFit chess match between me and Greg. Ooh, I like that. I like that combination. I've been challenging oh. people to do a heads up basketball slash PLO challenge. Oh, it's so fun. I mean, it sounds like a gimmick, but I would do it all day. I mean, because normally, like, doing something like burpees is just not fun at all. Like, Wait, yeah, <laughs> I'm doing burpees. But if you're actually, like, sitting there playing chess and then you're doing burpees, it's almost like the game is in your head, so you do them without thinking. You know what like, I mean? You did them together at the same time? Yeah. So basically, anytime 
I, one of my pieces gets captured, you have to you have to drop down and do three burpees while your clock is running. And so you you're, the clock is against you, so you need to 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 pound those burpees out really fast. That sounds amazing. I gotta put this in my in my in, in my challenge. You play basketball in between PLO. Wow, that's and a really good idea for a challenge like that. Is you 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 do the the athletic part of it during it. Exactly, because you don't because I don't like going like there's this there's this format called chess boxing, which is kind of popular where you switch from chess to boxing. But I think it's cooler when it's like it doesn't require a lot of space. So what if you instance, when we're playing CrossFit chess, we literally like play the chess and then like right next to that there's a mat and you do the burpees. So you don't have to move and you can finish it all in 10 minutes. What do you mean by chess boxing? People that hit each other during chess match? <laughs> no, it's just like crazy hybrid sport where you play like eight moves of chess and then you play a round of boxing and you win by checkmate or knockout. <laughs> I know. That is crazy. Oh, Max Chiswick um, asked me if I even CrossFit. I actually do. I mean, I'm I'm very inconsistent. Like most CrossFitters are super obsessed, and that's one of the reasons I think like people are turned off from CrossFit. They like I remember when I first went in there, they were I was like, can I do this like three or four times a week? And they're like, uh, nobody else does. Everybody else does it every single day. <laughs> but um, yeah, so it's hard for me to be really consistent, but I do. I love it. I do it. I do it like every time I'm in Philly, I go like almost every day. How was uh, the poker chess challenge you did with Ike? Hollywood it was, awesome. it was awesome. Like Ike, somebody actually asked me who who I idolize in the poker community, and Ike is definitely one of my poker heroes. So it was like really cool to see that he was going to be in the lineup, and he's just so nice. Like you, he's like um, so down to earth. You can really just like ask him anything. Mm -hmm. so, it was really fun. Ike Hollywood Hexton. Did you, did you beat him at? Yes, I yeah, won the chess game. Can no. you hear me? Is chess boxing code for rape? I have no idea what that means. Did I take my video off? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, okay. Uh, what, is there no video or something? Let me see. I, I, hello? It disappeared for a second. Uh, All right, I think I'm back in. I got I got disconnected. Oh yeah, no worries. So yeah, I I think we were just like wrapping up talking about chess boxing. Somebody yeah. asked like a kind of inane question about whether or not chess boxing is code for rape. I have no idea what that would mean. No, oh, that's just people just make questions up. But, yeah, we'll wrap this up. Uh, but I had a lot of fun. There was like, a lot of really good questions. Oh, thank you so. So I might be okay at my at, okay at doing podcasts, huh? Yeah, yeah, no, I, well, I told you even when, even when I got in the way of that interview with Jamie, I thought you still, like, asked her a lot of good questions and everything, got to a lot of really good topics, so. I don't know how, I, I think I have a, I think I'm good at uh, asking questions and, and, and uh, following up on certain points that people make, so I think I can get a bit better at it, but I'm, it's, uh, I'm still new to it, you know, I guess I'm not new to it, I've been doing it almost for a year now, oh my god, but, but yeah, I'm, I'm steadily improving, I think, with each one. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of there's a lot of good interview techniques. I feel like it's one of the things I love to do too. Interviewing people and asking people questions. It's really fun. So mm -hmm. you're, you know the you know the one of the rules is that you're supposed to ask like the really um the really unpleasant bad questions at the very end, so you don't piss somebody off. Oh, so you kind of like you butter them up, and then at the end is when you just like jab them with the with those hard hitting sharp questions. So now they like like you, and then they're like, oh shit, okay. Yeah, like if something, like if there's like something that that might piss people off so much that they're gonna hate you for the rest of the interview, or that they're even gonna hang up on you, you definitely you say that for last. It's kind of obvious, but at the same time, it's like, um, you know, I, you know, because I was interviewing this guy um, for the St. Louis Chess Club actually, who um, made this mural, and it was um, a mural of a, um, it was supposed to kind of depict the rook. and it was really beautiful, but it was also like clearly like somewhat r racially. Um, Inspired, you can you can actually like um, I'll probably tweet it or something at some point. There's gonna be a video interview, but um, it was like a a, a black man um, holding a, a white man's decapitated head, 
And so, like, to me, it's St. Louis, you know, Ferguson just happened. Like, clearly there's something racial going on here with this work, right? Yeah. So, obviously, it's, like, the first thing I ask him. And he's just, like, he doesn't like the question. So, he, like, answers very curtly and we're on to the next thing. And I'm, like, oh, that, that kind of sucks. Like, I definitely wanted more there. So, then, like, maybe, like, 20 minutes in, I asked him about it again after, you know, we really got to know each other. And, and like, you know, just the words and the ideas just keep spilling out, you know? Mm-hmm. So, luckily, I got a chance to ask him about it again. But if, like, there was, like, some time constraint, you could see that I made, like, a big blunder by opening with that. It's quite, it's an interesting, uh, that's, like, podcast strategy right there. Yes, exactly. I like it. Although I don't really ask too many people offensive questions where they get upset because I would rather just not do that. But in the future, I should remember that. Well, it, it more like if there's something controversial you have to ask something about. Like if there was like some kind of like scandal that they were involved in at some point, and like you you want to bring it up, you know, you might you might not bring it up at the very beginning, you know, <laughs> or you might. <laughs> I kind of bring it up. I feel like you know, like Juggle Man, I had him on. He's obviously been in some controversial things, and I feel like I just asked him that right away, and he was pretty open about it. But it's a good point. I probably should maybe wait till the end to ask some things like that. Ask, someone said, like, you ask the easy things at first that are easy for someone to answer, and then you progressively get into tougher questions that become a bit more complex from that stamp, from there. And then, uh, yeah. But I'm always like, but I like to ask interesting things at first because I know people only listen to, like, the first, you know, like, 15, 25 minutes. So I, I want to ask the good questions right away to encourage people to keep listening rather than listening at first to the boring shit and then they turn it off. Yeah, well... One more question somebody asked about, what would I answer to anti-feminists who would tell you that you're an exception, billion brilliant and all, but in the end, chess and poker will always remain male-dominated? Um, yeah, I mean, this is something you get a lot, like, where people, like, want to treat you as an exception because you're in the chess and the poker worlds, or they want to treat me as an exception and be like, well, it's not the norm. Most, most women's brains aren't suited for that. And I, I do try to resist that because I don't, I don't want to be that, that woman who's like, you know, I'm... I'm I'm particularly amazing because girls aren't even suited for that because I don't really believe that. I think I've gotten really lucky and I've met like I've had like a really supportive family and I've gotten like just like some lucky breaks along the way for people that I've met that have given me kind of like confidence that I could succeed in these areas. You know, so maybe that's the exception, the fact that I've gotten really lucky in those areas. But, you know, everything is just like a lot of it's about hard work and motivation. So women, women can do it if like that's what they want. Uh, one last one. Sammy says, who would you, who would Jennifer recommend to do a podcast with me? Oh, who do I think would be good on your show? Oh, God. Who would you recommend? I mean, I might, who knows if they'd be good? You never really know. Yeah, I, 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 obviously I think you should have more women in you, although you've had a lot of women on, haven't you? I try to have a lot of women on. Women are fun. I like, I mean, guys like women. Why would I, I like having women on. You know who would be really fun, who I think is like super awesome? Fatima. Like the poker stars pro who was also an Olympic um, athlete because she's just like Dutch. Uh, What's that? The Dutch woman, right? I mean, yeah, she is. She has her personality is amazing. Like I. I Lex. What's that? I think her and Lex are friends. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, and she in the beginning I don't think she was as into poker, but she's been in it for a long time, so she really takes it very seriously. But she's one of those people who's kind of toying with people at the table as well with her personality, and I, I admire that. All right, she looks like she's not one taking it seriously, but it seems like, I mean, she probably really is, obviously. One, one more person to recommend, and then that's it. Um, oh, Fatima is too easy. I need to pick somebody, like, a little bit, like, more offbeat. Oh, my friend Julianne. She, Cornelius. You should get her on. She's, like, a sweetheart. She's one of those people in poker where it's just, like, um, amazing that she's able to like succeed in poker and she's had some like really great results lately and also be just like such a nice person. I really admire that because I think it's so difficult. Like I've had to struggle with that in my own life um, when I'm playing in a tournament and I want to like be Miss Personality and make friends with everybody at the table. But then I know that that will cut into my aggression. Like mm-hmm. it might like if there's like it's it's not like I'm I'm, I'm going to be, like, super passive because of that. But I might be having a conversation instead of looking for a spot. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And then that spot will go by, and, you know, that's that. So I think it's really admirable when people are able to combine that, like, being Mr. or Mrs. personality and also, like, still having all that aggression. So I think you should have Julianne. She's, like, the sunshine of the poker world. You know who she is, right? 
she's an emo, emoji expert on Twitter. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. She can give you some emoji dating tips also. She's a, a, I never thought about that, but I actually probably could actually. Oh, definitely. I mean, it's like, I feel like that's really tender too because emojis can seem kind of like feminine. So you have to be like really careful. You, if you use them too much, you might just seem like kind of like too girly, you know? Yeah. I'm not worried. I don't know. I probably, I probably do a couple of girly things. I'm not, I'm nice to embrace it, whatever. Yeah, yeah. That's okay. good. All right, guys. I think that's it. We'll wrap it up. Jen, thanks for coming on. If they want to follow you on Twitter, at Jen Shahad. Yeah, Shahadi, but that's okay. Jen Shahadi. Shahadi. Oh, did I say it wrong? Oh, my God. That's so bad now. Jen Shahadi. I've been saying Jen Shahad to myself, like, since I know you, since I've known know who you are. Yeah, no worries. That's what most people think it is. So, yeah. So, Jen Shahadi, at Jen Shahadi, and then I'm also on Instagram. So, yeah, look me up. And, um... It was, it was fun being on your podcast. You're good at this. So keep oh. doing it. Oh, thank you, Jen. If you want to find Jen's TED speech, so I know Ben mentioned that earlier, just Google Jen's name and TED Talk. And um, I think that's it. Jen, thanks for coming out. We'll probably, I'm probably going to ha ha probably have you on again because you're a fun person to have on. So. Okay, cool. I'm going to win something big, and then you'll have me on again. How's that? I mean, you don't have to win anything. I don't really care. You can just win nothing and come back out. I don't mind either way. <laughs> that sounds good, too. Cool. I just like the, the former idea even better. Yeah, I mean, I, if you want to win stuff, if you like, want to win the main event, then I can have another uh, another champ on here. That'd be, that'd be perfect, actually. That'd be a good idea. If you want to win something big, please do it. So. Great. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening. All right, guys, thanks for tuning in. Um, I'll be back soon. I'm probably going to podcast again this week sometime with um, – actually, I, I can't say for sure who it's going to be, so I don't want to mention names. So we got some fun guests coming up. So thank you. Enjoy. Peace out. Much love, puppies, amigos, mommies.